seconds early. I don't think so. <laughs> Let the record reflect that we have reconvened with all members present. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and A uh, motion for the executive minutes of September 23rd, 2013. I'll move them. I'll second. Already discussed in executive. Roll call vote, please. Mayor Con I'm sorry. Yep. <laughs> um, Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Natale? <clears throat> yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Walkowick? Yes. Mr. Ripholtz? Yes. We have a motion for the regular minutes of September 23rd, 2013. I'll move them. I'll second. Council discussion? Seeing then, roll call vote, please. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Batali? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Rebholtz? Yes. I didn't vote. <laughs> oh, you better help vote yes. That was a test. <laughs> Happens all the time. <laughs> no, I got left behind once behind as a child. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, welcome everyone for a, uh, a rare Wednesday and a very rare Wednesday in that it's uh, election day. So hopefully it, now that it's past 8 p.m. that everyone in the room has... Uh, user uh, right to vote, um, and that also is the reason why we have uh, Patty Macalusa here filling in for Liz Osborne, who is downstairs um, managing the voting process. Yeah. I would like to uh, welcome Ed Reb Rebolts to the table, or welcome back after a, a break, uh, appointed at our last meeting and uh, now ready to serve out the year. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. The, um, and also somewhat related to Ed being at the table is uh, Jeannie Sukamoto is planning on being here at the November 25th meeting to be uh, recognized for her uh, service of uh, almost two full terms for the borough. So we will have a traditional uh, proclamation and other recognition for that date. So that's November 25th. I want to recognize the employees of the month for October, Dave Arglair, Joel Phillips, and Tom Corbo of the Electric Utility for the work they performed troubleshooting the voltage tap changer issues at James Park substation, then removing the old equipment, rewiring new digital equipment without the interruption of electrical service to Madison residents, which is, of course, very much appreciated by everyone. And a couple of anniversaries, Michael Giordano of the Public Works celebrating his 25th anniversary on October 25th, and Carol Bradshaw in the tax collector's office 25 years on October 3rd. And one other uh, mention, since uh, it seems like a while back already, but uh, we had Bottle Hill Day since our last meeting, and it was incredible. Another beautiful Bottle Hill Day. Streets of Madison packed, a lot of people enjoying themselves, and what is not noticed is the amount of hard work that goes on by all the volunteers to make that happy, happen, but uh, in particular, Lisa Ellis, who chairs that event. Um, I don't know how she does it. She then... Um, Posted on Facebook, the next day she was in Boston watching one child play uh, field hockey, and the next day she was in Michigan watching another one. So, <laughs> we're, uh, I don't know, if we can figure out what she does, it, we may start generating our own power here. <laughs> and uh, can I have a motion on Resolution 282, the Resolution Borough of Madison confirming membership of Connor McGee in the Madison Hook and Ladder Company, number one? Uh, I so move. Do I have a second? A second. Council discussion. May I have roll call vote, please. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Walkowitz? Yes. Mr. Repholtz? Yes. Right, may I have uh, Connor up here, Chief? Uh, Connor, whoever you, you want to, to assist with the swearing in?
Solomon swear. Solomon swear. faithfully. Yeah. Impartially. Yeah. And justly. Yeah. Perform all the duties. Yeah. Volunteer fireman. Yeah. Madison Hook and Ladder, company number one. Yeah. And to the best of my ability, I just realized I didn't grab the microphone. And to the best of my to the best of my ability. I further solemnly swear that I will, defend, I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New Jersey and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and to the government established in the United States and in, the, in, in this state under the authority of the people so help you God. Honor, welcome, and thank you for volunteering for the Borough of Madison. We have reports from committees, health, Ms. Vitale. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Madison Health Department um, presented the council with pins to commemorate the Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is an annual campaign to increase awareness of the uh, disease. Um, they were put in your packet. I don't know if everybody, no? Nobody, uh, okay. All right, yeah, yeah. So we got ours. I didn't get it. <laughs> okay. Um, while most people are aware of breast cancer, many forget to take the steps to have a plan to detect the disease in its early stages and encourage others to do the same. Um, the health department is also sponsoring Pink Fridays for the month of October and has uh, asked all of the employees to wear pink on each of the four Fridays in October, 4, 11, 18, and 25th as well as wearing their Celebrate Life early detection pins. Um, we hope that everyone joins us in participating in such a worthwhile um, uh, event to bring attention to breast cancer and early detec uh, detection. At the end, um, Madison is hosting uh, a women's health screening program on Monday, um, October 28th, starting at 9 a.m. And it's open to all women in Madison, 18 and over, who live uh, and work in Madison, actually, including nannies and other household employees and those without health insurance coverage. Um, it's a comprehensive checkup for women. So um, think about making your, um, your appointments to get down there. There is an appointment that's necessary, but if you call the uh, Madison Health um, uh, Department, uh, they'll get you in, no problem. There's still flu shots. Everybody hasn't gotten their flu shots. Um, you know, you can still make an appointment. And uh, one of the, uh, the good things that the health department actually does is if you have somebody that's not capable of coming out of their home and needs that flu shot, uh, one of the nurses would be happy to get there for you. Um, uh, the reminder to all the parents about the preschool children. Um, children cannot attend preschool or daycare uh, if they're between the ages of 6 and 59 months, they have to have that flu shot by December. Otherwise, they can't attend <coughs> the class. So there's always uh, children health clinics as well um, at the health department. Um, we are going to sponsor also rabies clinics in tw uh, for 2013 and 14. Um, that's their free, their free um, clinics on Saturday, December the 7th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. All the dogs and cats must be licensed in Madison each year with a late fee imposed after January 31st. And all rabies vaccines must be valid through October 31st of the year of renewal. This year, what the Madison Health Department is doing, we're offering extended hours. So there is like an off on-site 
uh, license registration at the same time. So you can get your license, the, uh, your, your pet can have the rabies shot, and that's on December 7th and the 18th from 4.30 <coughs> to 7.30. January uh, hours will also be announced. Um, so if you need to find out how to get a renewal packet or whatever, that's all posted on, on the health department website. And uh, also, we're continuing our vaccine for adults um, through the New Jersey Vaccine for Adults program. And these, uh, this program allows for uninsured and underinsured to receive um, vaccines such as meningitis, hepatitis. So also, you can call um, the health department for details and appointments. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We'll move utilities down to batting order and go to Public Works and Engineering. Mr. Catanella. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, so leaf pickup is going to begin on October 28th. So there are three ways for residents to dispose of their leaves. Number one, um, containers or bags at the curb. And please note that using containers or bags will save the borough money and, keep, and, keep, and help keep your taxes low. This is the preferred method. Weekly curbside collection of yard waste and containers will continue until December 18th, 2013. Free bags are available at the Public Works Garage and other borough offices beginning yesterday. Um, number two, you can bring your leaves to the municipal garage. Residents can bring leaves to the municipal garage on weekdays from October 28th through December 6th between the hours of 7.30 a.m. and 3 p.m. Note this is weekdays only and no commercial dumping is allowed. Third, you can rake to the curb. Collection will start on October 28th, and weather permitting will continue until early December. December 6th is the last day to put your leaves out to the curb. In order to make curbside collection of leaves more efficient, please place the leaves in the street. This allows our workforce to use front end loaders for pickup when the leaves are wet. Please call the Department of Public Works at 973-593-3088. That number is available on Rosenet. If you need any additional information, thank you very much. In addition to that, uh, there's some new grinding pump, uh, new grinding pump being installed at the uh, North Street pump station last week. Finally, as it pertains to some of our construction work, the Green Avenue reconstruction work is underway by Civilian Sons General Contractors. Drainage improvements will be constructed this week. Curb and sidewalk improvements will be begin next week. This project is proceeding on budget and on schedule. The sports field parking lot at the former Bailey Ellard property is underway by Tilcon General Contractors. The parking lot, parking lot and site remediation progress, pro project have progressed where the base asphalt course for the new lot is complete. Next week, the final paving, drainage swales, berm hydro seeding, fencing, and planting will commence. This project is proceeding on budget and ahead of schedule. The Hartley Dodd boiler replacement is underway by Omega Service General Contractors. Temporary boilers have been brought uh, in to address a severe delay in a project start and overall schedule. Approximately half the project has been invoiced and completed. Contractor states it will be complete by the end of the month. The 2013 water main replacement is near completion by Garcia Construction General Contractors. The final phase of installation on Ridgedale Avenue has been put in place and tested for public use. Prior work on Green Village Road and the Green Woodland intersection was completed last month. The project will proceed through conclusion. However, there may be some negotiation uh, regarding claims uh, due to a schedule lag. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Community Affairs. Mr. Landrigan. I was Thank getting you, confused Mayor. over here. <laughs> no worries. Um, this Thursday is the last farmer's market. Um, if you haven't been able to make it, Please try to get there. Um, I've been going to it. Some very good stands, so please make every effort you can to get there. The birds just truly appreciate it. Um, Halloween's coming up, and I'm just going to read you some information here. Uh, there's some details. Okay, the Madison Chamber of Commerce is sponsoring its 2013 Halloween Hoopla on Saturday, October 26th, starting at 12.15 p.m. Children and their parents are invited to attend a Halloween costume parade followed by a magic show and trick-or-treating in the downtown business area. Now here's a schedule of events. 12-15 is a Halloween parade and participants should meet at the Green Village Road School on King's Road. On, uh, excuse me, meet at Green Village Road Field on King's Road. The parade will start on King's Road 
leaving the field at 12.30 p.m. sharp and finishing at Waverly Place. From 1 to 1.30, there'll be a magic show, which will be held on the corner of Lincoln and Waverly Place. In case of rain, the show will be held in the gym at the Madison Junior School. Madison Photo Plus, located at 40 Bain Street, has generously offered to take a free photo of each child in their costume. Details will be available at Madison Photo Plus on the day of the event. And then finally, 1.30 to 3, trick-or-treating. Children in costume are invited to trick-or-treat through the downtown business district. Participating stores will display a bright orange and black jack-o'-lantern in their windows. Please have plenty of candy at the ready to distribute. So, again, uh, October 26th is the day. Um, and if you need more information, you could get it at info at madisonnjchamber.org. Now, finally, uh, you've noticed around town we've had these nice works of art being displayed. Um, they're going up for auction. The auction will be held at Borough Hall this Friday, starting at 7 o'clock. Now, that's for VIPs and then general admission is later. But since everybody in this room is considered a VIP, we have VIP tickets to hand out. So these tickets will stay right here on this desk, and after the meeting, please feel free to take one, come to the auction. There'll be some uh, refreshments served. It'll be a good time, so please show up. Okay, the tickets are right here. Everybody's a VIP. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Public safety, Ms. Bailey. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first off, Project Community Pride. Um, two of our social workers attended uh, a, in September a conference on threat and risk assessment management of children and young adults, connecting the dots for violence prevention in school settings and communities. Uh, our team at Project Community Pride are also putting together a blog about mental health topics they are beginning also um, a, a presentation on prescription drug abuse for parents. There, this will include a speaker provided by Quest Diagnostics, who is a former DEA agent, and also Frank Iannarone of Madison Pharmacy will be hel uh, helping. And as the year, school year begins, so does Project Community Pride. Referrals are coming in and from both the police and the schools and they're off to um, a very active start um, this fall. Then from the police department, the police department responded to 2,645 calls for service during the month of September. Also during the month of September, Madison officers investigated 19 suspicious incidents, 12 suspicious motor vehicles, 13 suspicious persons, along with other calls for service. And they also made 30 arrests. Um, other things um, that the uh, auxiliary police have done, they conducted 42 hours of work training during September, and they assisted with the Madison Farmer's Market and Bottle Hill Day, and we thank them for their service. The Madison Volunteer Ambulance Corps and the police department responded to 93 medical emergencies for the month of September. For the fire department, oh, oh one more thing from the police department, um, which is extremely important for the residents of Madison because they're saving us money. The accreditation of the police, Madison Police Department has begun. The Joint Insurance Fund is funding this project for the borough at no cost to the borough. Once we complete this program, our insurance premiums are projected to decrease by up to 8% annually. In addition, the police department will now have updated policies and procedures and enhanced training opportunities for the officers. Fire Department. October is the month for getting the word out on fire prevention. This year's theme is kitchen safety. Cooking is the top cause of fires in homes and fire-related injuries in the United States, followed by heating equipment. Madison's program reaches out to over 2,500 people in our community. We, they go to the schools, they go to nursing um, homes, they go to uh, private schools, preschool, and daycare and also any senior groups. And any pro they also give the programs when people come to visit the fire department. And also a reminder from our fire department, please do not park your vehicles on piles of leaves because you could cause a fire. And do not block or cover fire hydrants when you pile your leaves out on the curb. And from the County Office of Emergency Management, they asked Madison Ambulance Corps um, 
to participate in a statewide drill at Newark Airport this Saturday. So if you see a lot of ambulances at the airport, don't be alarmed, it's a drill. <laughs> and I think uh, there's one other thing, uh, Mayor, we'd like to congratulate uh, our newest little firefighter. Um, the arrival of Owen Richard Norwick, he weighed nine pounds, 10 ounces, 21 inches long. You know, he's almost there for <laughs> volunteer duty. And he was born September 30th at 1148 AM. So congratulations to Amanda and Sean on their new arrival. Everybody's doing very well. Thank you. Very good. Finance and Clerk, Mr. Wolkowitz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the string of, of good news continues. I hope by saying that uh, I don't put a kibosh on it, but so far so good. One of the uh, highlights of the last month was the auction on Bello Avenue. 27 Bello was auctioned for $462,000, which was a, a very nice result. We have Jim Burnett to thank for that. A man of many talents can now add auctioneer to his list. The, um, uh, as an FYI, the open enrollment period for uh, health care for our employees has begun. And our, our employees, like unfortunately employees <coughs> everywhere, are contributing larger and larger amounts to their own health care. And um, the flip side of that, of course, is it represents the savings for the borough. So this like most things, there's two sides to every story. Uh, next week, and again, this is just an FYI, but next week in Vineland, New Jersey, will be a meeting of the Public Power Association in New Jersey. And I'll just reiterate what I said before, Jim Burnett's the president of that organization. And I'll be accompanying him this time because Vineland, of the nine municipalities that have their own electric utility, produces the most power on its own. And that's one thing that we would like to look into, i.e. having Madison not only distribute power, but perhaps manufacture it as well. So we're going to go to a, a town that's been quite successful in that regard and see how it's done. The, um, as I re mentioned at the beginning, the borough's monthly cash flow continues to be strong. And uh, what I haven't mentioned in the past, and it, I, it's really uh, an oversight of, uh, of major proportions on my side, is that one of the significant contributors to this good result are our employees. It's quite clear that the notion of spending this money carefully that we give them to run each department is taken to heart, and it's really a, a, an undercurrent among all our departments. So uh, I, a personal thank you very much, and uh, uh, as I say, as a res in large part as a result, right now our finances are in very good shape. One other note, uh, on our uh, agenda for tonight is a report by the uh, Madison Athletic Foundation, wh which unfortunately will not happen because they were unable to make this uh, a date, but they are rescheduled for November 12th. So if any of you came expecting to hear it, uh, very sorry, but uh, it is what it is. Thank you. Thank you. And utilities, Mr. Reboltz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, spent some time with both departments this morning. And um, electric department's doing well, installing new poles, secondary and primary voltage cables on Crescent, it's Hill Crescent Road, completed new cable installation on Wayne and Anthony Drive, completed pole transfer in Garfield, installing new poles, secondary and primary voltage, voltage cables on Oxford Lane and Canterbury Road. So all moving along nicely, no big, no major issues. On the water department, Ridgedale Water Main is now complete. A few, a uh, few items, small items need to be, re to be done, but for all intents and purposes, it's complete, it's live. Chlorination equipment is gonna be installed next week. Nitrate testing is happening this, this month. Um, we should have, uh, we should complete our state reports uh, later on this month. <coughs> Waiting on, uh, they're inspecting the water tank on Madison Avenue. And that should happen in, within a week. They're flushing Main Street and Park Avenue fire <coughs> hydrants and that should start this week. Um, and all wells are working, are in good working order and levels are satisfactory. 
that's my review. Thank you. Any communications and petitions? Uh, none received, Mayor. Very good. Okay, this is now the first of uh, two opportunities for the public to comment. This is the one with restrictions. You can only comment on items on the agenda discussion list, which is uh, number 13 on the agenda, or resolutions that are listed for uh, on the consent agenda. Ordinances will have separate hearings, and so when they are up for hearing is when you can comment on the ordinances. And as mentioned, the MAF report uh, will, has been pushed to, actually it's November 13th, it's another Wednesday meeting because of Veterans Day. Uh, we will be in that slot um, talking about the MRC uh, parking lot and the paving of the parking lot there with open space funds. Uh, number two on the agenda is the uh, user fee ordinance. ordinance. We have an ordinance uh, prohibiting smoking and all borough property, including public parks and recreation areas. We have the appropriation of funds on 27, from 27 Balu Avenue. I understand some people are from various neighborhoods. That's the opportunity. You can comment on that because it uh, affects uh, funding of road projects. Um, grant approval for open space fund for the James Building, also known as the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts and a presentation on the strategic planning process. That's the planning one, as we explained shortly, is part one of two, because we'll continue it at our next meeting. So with that, anyone interested in commenting on any of those items or the resolutions may step up to the lectern, state your name, your address, and please keep your comments to three minutes or less. Tom? We'll take Mr. Ryan first and then. Good evening. For those of you that I have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Robert Ryan. <clears throat> I live at 15 Academy Road with my family, where I have been for the past 54 years. Like your mayor, our mayor, Mr. Connolly, I'm a native of Madison, have grown up here, and uh, I've seen many changes. I used to sell the Saturday Evening Post on Academy Road when I was a little kid. I think it was five cents a copy. I, I maybe got two pennies out of that. <laughs> but uh, uh, we've seen many, many changes since. Uh, the house that we live in has been renovated. Many of the houses around us have been repaired and changed. And we still have the same good old street, Academy Road. Hasn't been paid but once in those 54 years. The curbings are a disgrace. They're all broken. The sidewalks are in tough shape because the trees have grown and swelled the cement out of its uh, position. So that uh, I come to you tonight as a representative of uh, some 20 families on Academy Road who all could not be here, but we have a few. And we would like to ask that you give favorable consideration to the repair, repaving of Academy Road, which so badly needs it. And uh, with that, I will say, Good night. Thank you. And we'll be discussing that shortly. And my first memory, just to add this, uh, Academy Road was my first sleepover, which was in the Ryan's house with uh, Rob <laughs> when I was in kindergarten. So good to see you. Anyone else wish to be heard on any? Stacy? And then, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll work our way back down. So we'll get to you. You moved further back on me. You threw me off. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Stacy Russo. I'm, a, I'm also a resident of Academy Road. Um, it, it was my understanding that 
this um, this capital project has been on the, been on the budget since 2007, and um, I know we had Mayor Mariana and, and the council person. They met with residents of Academy Road a couple years ago, and they basically told us that it was on the top of the list. So we've been patiently waiting for for years, and. Um, in the spring of 2012, they excavated the road for, I think it was for the water, and I know we had the gas company come and um, I think they put some safety pipes on the outside of our house. And right now, when I turn down this, the road off of Green Village Road, when I turn down there, I have to drive down the middle of the road because there is a pothole that is so big that I'm afraid it's going to rip my tire. So. I'll just be brief. I think I'm, I am speaking on behalf of, of everyone on the street because we've had meetings and um, we would just like to see the project completed because it's, it has been started, um, you know, with the excavation, et cetera. So um, that's, all I'm, that's all I have to say. So I'd just like to, you know, we'd like to see it finished. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, thank you, you Stacy. Tom. <laughs> Mayor. <clears throat> I'm Thomas Judd. Uh, I am the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts, and I would like to present a short statement uh, concerning the James Library building. The Museum of Early Trades and Crafts considers the maintenance and preservation of the James Library building to be an important part of our mission. In 2011, we discovered that ongoing moisture damage to the building was becoming a serious problem. Rather than simply attempt repairs, we contracted with the historic building architects of Trenton to create a preservation plan for the building. In addition to their architectural studies, they brought in specialized civil and structural engineering firms to conduct scientific studies. These studies included CCTV analysis of underground storm drains, thermal scans to assess water penet penetration, and impulse radar scans to verify construction of the building's walls. They also brought in a large cherry picker to examine the condition of the clock tower and the roof. We believe that this is the first time that such a thorough and scientific study of the building has been done, and it was done at no cost to the borough. The results of that study revealed that both remediation of existing water damage and preventative repairs to the building were urgently needed. The architects have created a multi-stage prioritized plan to preserve the building. We have worked closely with Mr. Cody and Mr. Vogel on this project and both have copies of the architect's report. The work is far beyond the abilities of the museum to finance. We have identified matching <coughs> grants that will pay for 80% of the work. The money we have requested from the Open Space and Historic Preservation Trust Fund will enable these matching grants to provide $4 for every $1 that we invest. We believe this is a win-win situation for all parties to enable the preservation of this important historic building. We can provide some additional information if you wish, but uh, we think that the, the gist of the story is that this building needs some help and we have done everything in our power to get there without putting any burden on the borough. So we would request that our request be approved. Thank you very much. Yes. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Mary Beth Forte. I'm also a resident of Academy Road, and I don't want to waste time by echoing my neighbor's comments, so I agree with them, and I would just add the fact that it's also a safety concern for our children. As they're riding their bikes and their scooters, he's hitting, they are hitting these potholes and they're falling down, they're getting injured. So that's a concern of mine. So I would just ask, I know that you can't make decisions this evening, but that you consider it sincerely and strongly as part of funding for next year, and I thank you for that consideration. 
Thank you, Mary Beth. And, uh, Ray, you made a uh, note of the uh, potholes because uh, obviously, no matter what is decided, it were. So we'll get the uh, road department on that. Come on up. Come on up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Justin Smith, War Academy Road. Uh, just to expand a little bit on what some of my neighbors have said. I have personal knowledge that the curbing has been in a state of disrepair since sometime bef before February 1981, and it has only gotten worse. Uh, when the street, the roadway was in a fairly uniform <coughs> condition prior to the road work that was done about a year and a half ago, uh, at least this, the road surface was fairly well used but fairly uniform. Now it's all patched and it's kind of emphasized the way the curving was. In addition, as far as the year 2007 date that was mentioned previously, <clears throat> I, I understood that the, back in 1999, that was when I first heard the 2007 date. And since then it has been, I believe, postponed at least once or twice since 2007. So the year 2007 was kicking around for quite a while before it was postponed and still hasn't been done. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Anyone else wishing to be... I'm Elizabeth Ryan, and I, I, I wish I lived in Madison, um, but I grew up here, and I'm here to support, support the notion in case, at the risk of being redundant, in case, you know, you haven't had the message. Um, I want to thank you for the amazing job you do keeping Madison such a very, very beautiful place. Um, it's a rare community. But I also uh, would like to uh, reinforce the um, comments that have been made about the very, very poor quality of the curbing, um, the roads, the sidewalks. Um, it's, it's a little surprising in, in a community like Madison, and it's actually, uh, from my point of view, a safety concern. So I, I fret a lot about the people who live on the street and the potential tripping hazards. So um, I'm sure you're going to address this. Thank you. Make sure you sign in before you. Please. Sorry. Thank you. Anyone else wishing me? My name is Kevin Kilgore. I live at 8 Academy Road. Uh, I'd like to reiterate the issues that everyone else is having on our street. Madison is a beautiful town. There's a lot of beautiful streets except for ours. The, <laughs> the curbs are literally falling apart. My father, who's 76 years old, just a couple of weeks ago got out of his car and tripped on, a, on part of our curb that literally is falling off. A piece of concrete is falling into the street. There's a sinkhole in front of our house. It's, uh, it's embarrassing. And it's dangerous. We, there's a lot of little children on the street. There's a lot of elderly folks. People walk down the street. They don't even use the sidewalks because they're falling apart. They walk in the middle of the street. As Stacy was saying, it's difficult to, to drive on the street because there's so many potholes. So we hope that you'll address this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Pat? Justin's just signing in his name since he... Just get a stamp. Hi, Pat Road, 25 Pine Ave, Madison, New Jersey. Two quick things. First is the ordinance on the, um, the user fees and the rental fees. I spoke about this last time, but I see it really hasn't changed. Uh, it still says that the fees shall be used for debt service, operation, and maintenance of the turf fields, which to me really means that the money is just going to go for operations and maintenance. When, we, when these fees were, were requested of the, of the users, it was meant to pay for the fields, which meant either pay for the actual purchase or the debt service to cover, not the ongoing maintenance. That was something the borough was always assumed it was going to cover. And it really shortchanges the sports groups, and it also shortchanges the rest of the residents who expected to see, not see that burden come onto them because these fees were being paid. And this is covered both in the user fees and also the, um, the field rentals. The second is, I, I took a quick look at the planning process, and if I read this correctly, and I'll, I'll, I guess I'll have to wait until the actual presentation is made, it sounds like we're not going to know until next May uh, if I read this correctly, what the story is with the electric utility in terms of the surpluses, the rates, and the application of that money. I was really hoping that that would be done a lot sooner. I stood here, I sat there probably about a year ago and requested that that analysis be done. And now it appears it's being rolled into this process and it's going to be pushed out another seven months. 
I really think the council needs to have that information by the time it starts its budget process in January. In fact, they should not only have that information, but it should have a town hall to explain to people what the state of the electric utility is, what the state of the wholesale rates are going to be, and how that money can be applied during next year's budgeting process and future budgeting years. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Melissa Hanahan, Two Pine Avenue, Madison. Um, I agree with you, a lot of things have changed in Madison, but the one thing that we do still have is the James Building. And as a member of the Open Space Committee, as well as uh, a citizen of Madison, I think it's important that we consider keeping that piece of um, beautiful history as part of Madison safe and well kept. So. Thank you. Maureen, you'll be next. Hi, my name is Mark Zeri. I'm a new resident at 25 Academy Road. Um, don't want to reiterate a lot of what's been said. Uh, I have an 18-month-year-old and a three-year-old, and we like to walk to the town, but unfortunately, um, we're forced to push our stroller down the center of the street because the sidewalks are unusable. So while I appreciate Stacy's concern about driving down the middle of the street, um, I, you know, we have to push a stroller down the middle of the street until we get to Green Village Avenue, and then it's clear sailing from there because it's beautiful. So I uh, appreciate your consideration and uh, getting this uh, corrected quickly. Thanks. Thank you. Maureen Byrne, 49 Albright. I want to start by commending everybody from Academy for coming out tonight on Speaking Up. This is truly participatory democracy, in effect, and I sincerely hope that your words will be taken into consideration. But I want to point out that the last, that if we do the Academy Road project, the last two big uh, surfacing projects that we have done here in Madison will be done directly because of participatory democracy, because people came out and complained about the status of the road. And we can't continue to address our capital needs because 10 people show up at a borough council meeting. What we need to do and what we should do quickly is a survey of our infrastructure and then prioritize those projects so that we take care of them in a timely fashion and we, have, and we know that we have the finances with which to take care of them, whether it be from the, the wonderful utility surplus that we're going to generate or through other revenues, matching grants, whatever. But we really need to take a long-term approach to our capital needs because we can't keep reacting. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone wish else to be heard? Yes. And, and what just so we have a lot of new faces in the audience as you're not getting any responses mainly because this is an agenda item and so the council makes note of everything you say and as we get to the discussion item they may <laughs> comment at that point. So. Hi, I'm Lauren Kander from 11 Academy Road and I understand what you're saying but we were also Two and a half years ago, many council members, maybe older, you know, council members that are no longer with us, and a different mayor, came to our, um, <coughs> came to one of the houses and promised two and a half years ago that we would be on slate for the spring. So it's not just that, like we're coming here for the first time. We've been waiting patiently. We really haven't come to the meetings and stirred up anything, but now we're at the point where we feel it's due time. So I just want to get out of that. Thank you. That we were all did you sign in? Did you sign in? Oh. <laughs> then, then doesn't get that. Yes. Hi, 
My name is Margaret Michalski. Um, I'm a member of Academy Road. I was born and raised there. They were there a couple years ago. I remember they were going to put storm drains or sewer drains in. They did the gas lines. They never did the sewer drain. Green Village was completely paved. I don't understand why Academy couldn't have been paved at the same time. Um, most likely will be put off until at least next spring, but we just want to know like when it's going to happen. You know. Thank you. Thank you. And just for clarification, because it is very confusing in the state of New Jersey, who takes care of what? Green Village Road is a county road, so that was done through county taxes and the uh, county government taking care of that. And also, as people understand, the progress of road reconstruction often is a uh, water main replacement followed by either a mill and overlay or, in the case of an academy road, a re full reconstruction, which includes, at that point, is when the stormwater work comes in because it's uh, the stormwater work, curbing, and paving. That was just to help people understand. Anyone else wishing to be heard on items on the agenda? Excuse me, Sam Searcy, Yellow Park Avenue, Madison. Um, I support the. I've been on Academy Road looking at some jobs in, in my business, but uh, I know we need a lot of roads done and a lot of stuff done. But what I would suggest, so they last, the roads and the curves last. I would strongly suggest that when you do put curves, you put Belgian block. Belgian block is much better than concrete. It lasts longer, looks better. Number one, also. If a plow hits the concrete curve, it knocks out a big section of the concrete, the chips and everything. If a plow hits a Belgian block, two or three Belgian blocks get loose, our own public works guys could fix. So again, it's a better job, and I don't know if it's that much more, but I don't think so. But what I suggest is any roads or any jobs got to be done in Madison that we strongly recommend, I strongly recommend that you use Belgian blocks, the granite blocks. Uh, I just want to touch on one resolution. Uh, resolution... Uh, 286. Second here. So we can get the. Um, includes a relative on there. Uh, you may, well, may not want to comment on. Yeah, I want to comment. Uh, I, I don't know if they're going to pass okay, it, but I. I, I okay, all right. I just go, sure, go, go right ahead. I sure wish they approved that uh, resolution. Yeah. And on behalf of my wife, I want to thank you, and you got a real good woman, because if she could put up with me, she can handle these kids. And thank you on behalf of my wife. There's a valid point. All right. <laughs> After that, anyone else wishing to be heard? All right. Uh, I'm Peggy Siriello from Five Academy Road, and I'm just here to support and reinforce everything everyone else has said. When we moved in in 2000, we, were, we heard the 2007 date, and uh, we're very excited because our kids were quite young at that time. <laughs> now they're high schoolers, <laughs> and we've come full circle. But it would be nice for the other families and the elderly people to have a safe condition and for our cars to last a little longer. Thank you. Please uh, sign in there, please. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Anyone not from Academy that couldn't make it tonight? <laughs> <laughs> With that, we will move on to our uh, agenda discussions. First one is the uh, paving of the parking lot at the MRC with um, open space funding. Bob, come on up. Come on. Good evening, everyone. Um, the uh, MRC parking lot, um, originally in the design plan for when the MRC was constructed, was a gravel lot. Uh, we moved towards a settlement with Landtech during that project, and we didn't know if we were going to have money left for any additional work, but after the settlement, we were able to go forward and do the base course of the parking lot. Unfortunately, the base mm -hmm. course of the parking lot left us with some accessibility issues where the uh, paved surface is not directly level with the handi handicapped ramps. Um, the rain gardens aren't fully effective because water uh, goes past them and there's a lift there between the Belgian block and the 
current paved surface. And um, obviously uh, anyone that's been there knows that it isn't striped yet, and so the parking lot isn't really being used very efficiently. So uh, with Tilcon in town, uh, we managed to um, have them prioritize this work for us, given uh, the availability of funds. So I thought it was important to approach both the Open Space uh, Committee and uh, the governing body and ask for that money at this stage of the game uh, as a timing issue because uh, it's, uh, they're a phenomenal paving company, uh, very well known, obviously does huge projects all around the state. Uh, they're here now with the Bailey Yellow parking lot and they'd like to kind of dovetail uh, uh, another project on it. And so. Um, that's the basis of the uh, agenda rec as it stands. And Osprey, from Open Space, you can uh, right, comment. Right. Um, Bob um, came before the Open Space Committee. He filled out the form that we now have for any recommend you know, requests. And the Open Space Committee passed a resolution last Wednesday asking that the council approve this project. Any other comments, questions? Okay, this uh, resolution is been added to the... Uh, Original agenda, consent agenda, so that we'll go for it. Thank sure. you, Bob. Thank you very much. 292. 292. Next agenda item is uh, the ordinance amending Chapter 136 to establish user fees for recreation programs and establishing a process to rent borough and parks and fields. Um, Jim, Jim, Jim oh, hi, Mary. Thank you. I worked with... Uh, Zach Ellis, Ray Cody, Matt Jacoby, and others, Bob Landrigan on this uh, ordinance. I'm adopting an ordinance uh, ordaining the rates and the process is important and appropriate. Our most recent annual municipal audit uh, actually cited a need to have user fees codified by ordinance. Um, section 1F states that the fees um, in the first section regarding user fees states that the user fees will be collected by the recreation director in accordance with policies established by the Recreation Director and the Recreation Advisory Committee, and that the funds will be used for debt service operation and maintenance of the fields. And operate a, an example of a situation where funds could be used for maintenance um, and not debt service, so I think the Council's general consensus is to want to use it for debt service, is if there's some sort of major damage that occurred to the, to the turf. If the turf were ripped or something like that, are there funds available to make a $1,000, $2,000, $5,000 immediate repair to it? Having a little bit of flexibility in the ordinance to grant that um, seemed to make sense to us. That's why it was drafted that way. Um, rentals, um, if the applicant is a sports camp, I just point out that the borough residents will be entitled to first priority to sign up for the sports camp and a 10% discount on the program fee. Um, the ordinance strictly regulates the proper use of the fields. That's something that's been important, and that's important not only for proper use of the fields and rentals, but also a proper use from the sports organizations. A second ordinance will be coming that uh, details the various sports organizations that use the fields and regulations for those organizations, but in this particular instance for entities that rent the fields, there are now strict regulations about the proper use of the fields, stating that the applicant <coughs> must take proper care of the fields and pay for any damage. And uh, the recreation director will maintain the, the schedule uh, of the fields in consultation with the borough administrator and the recreation advisory committee. So the recreation advisory committee will, will have a voice in uh, who is renting, um, how much of the field is being rented versus how much of it is available for the recreation programs in town. Let me, let me just go with Bob first. He has, has a, from recreation, do you have any to add to that before I take? No, no, Jim covered it all. Okay. That's fine. Osprey and then Ed. Okay, thank you. Um, Mayor, uh, yeah, I, Jim, I do have a question. This is an ordinance establishing entitled parks, establishing user fees for borough recreation programs and establishing the process to rent borough parks and fields. So under rentals, um, there, are, there are other fields that are going to be... Correct, correct. So in addition... All in rental fees from all fields will be going to the MRC, debt and maintenance and operation? Um, That's how it reads under yeah, E okay. of... Um, under, I'm referring to E, mm -hmm. under um, B, B1, E? No, yeah, no, it's E. B. No, it's E. After e. denial of permit. Second sentence of... of All field rentals will be two, reasonable, two. and any fees collected for the use of the turf fields shall be used for 
for debt the, service. So, use so you use the turf field, so the key word is the turf, okay. turf is in there. Okay, all right, yeah. that, that was... And if you look in section D1, the Madison Recreation Complex fields one and two mm -hmm. are defined friend, quote, turf fields, close quote, close quote, that's the very first page. Okay. So it's the turf field use that triggers yeah. that. And, and in actuality, Austria, mm -hmm. we have almost never rented any other field in town now that the turf fields are here. So um, while we do have other fields, uh, the Bailey Ellard fields and um, the Lucy D uh, fields and uh, the Sunny Vitale Little League fields on, on Rosedale, um, uh, this, I asked Zach Ellis that in this past year. It was almost exclusively. Okay, but isn't it a little confusing? I mean, shouldn't we have something regarding the No, it's this, what he says. It says field rental fees. This is all field rental fees to be reasonable and fees collected for the use of the turf fields okay. shall be used for debt service. So right now this is specific to the turf fields and the fees you generate from the rental of the turf fields, fields one and two, as defined in the whereas clause on the first page, would go to debt service and as Jim said, any maintenance for the turf fields specifically. If later on the borough council decides that they want to rent out Belly Ellard or another field, we can then amend that and, and have that. The, the purpose of this E was so that the, the, the fees that you generate from renting the turf fields one and two go to the debt service first and foremost and the care of the turf field. Yeah, yeah I have no problem with that. I just thought because the general title is referring to all borough fields that we should identify where the rental money is going to go for the other field. That's all. Right. Yeah, oh yeah, I think you're, you're right, but I think that's something you, you can do at a, a later date if you decide to rent the other fields. And, and oh, just review, oh, yeah, and yeah. It, okay. looking at the market, it's going to be no, a little bit here and there, so. Right, yeah. I understand it's a little bit yeah. here and no, there. No, I think you're right. We yeah. can do okay, it so in a menu ordinance. Yeah, so if you're going to rent out Billy Allard, you can say the Billy Allard, we're going to set up a fund to care for those fields. Okay, so Mr. Burnett, note that. <laughs> note it, so note it. Ed? And then Cornell. Um, this is an issue I spoke during the summer on, on the 22nd of July, and I'm still haven't reconciled where this was supposed to be a non-taxable event. And we still were supposed to move a million dollars to help pay for this, and that didn't happen. But we went out and borrowed. And we asked these phenomenal people that, that want to raise a lot of money, and, and bless their heart, and I think we should do everything in our power to encourage them to pay their share, and they've committed to but writing this takes their guts, their funding operation on their part of it. We, the rents, as I understand, from the fields was part of their fundraising program. Now, we're going to take that away and still say raise $900,000. I'm not sure if that's fair. Um, and I'm not sure if I, I can support this because we have a group of people that are raising their own money, raising money, which they have, and part of it is these rental fees, and uh, now we're stepping in and saying, no, we're going to put it off somewhere else. Um, I think we have a good, you know, we started with a good plan, a non-taxable event. Uh, independent people are going to raise money, and they raise several hundred thousand dollars. Uh, a dedicated group of people, and I think their share is about a 900 or a million dollars left. And part of that program, as I understand it, is the rental fees from the two fields. And um, now we're kind of gutting their fundraising operation, and I'm not sure how that serves that group. I'd much rather see us how we encourage the M MAF to raise more money. And 900000 a million is not a great deal of money in this community. I've been involved with a number of, with my church, fundraising activities, and we've raised a tremendous more money than that. Um, so that's my piece. I, 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 I cannot support this, because uh, I still go back. And I think it's also our commitment to the pop, to the citizens of Madison when we have a non-taxable event. And it's a matter of public trust, and that's a repeat statement from the July 22nd uh, present, uh, speaking when I spoke then. 
that we violate that public trust when we say we're going to do something and don't do it. So I'll just try to clarify some things, and Carmelo was next up. Just, Ed, since you're new to the table, um, what we did over the summer um, and probably going back to spring was a couple of meetings with the MAF going over their, their plan and refining it so it, it clarified what we we're going to do going forward. The discussion was around fundraising versus fee raising, and the um, process was we want, them, we want them to be successful, we want them to be successful in fundraising, which definition of fundraising, and this comes from my nonprofit background, um, is you know whether it's special events, direct solicitations right. through mailings, or major gift raising. So that's what we want to concentrate on. So when we looked at that, yes, the pro forma they had presented out there showing that the field could be affordable included user fees, but we backed that out of their goal. So their, the expectation for them is the original expectation they had minus the user fees. And so it, it gives them the ability to concentrate on that. It also answers the auditor's uh, comment that this is, you, you are charging fees and you have it flowing through a uh, nonprofit to the borough. This is now establishes an ordinance that backs up those fees and has the money mm -hmm. going directly to the borough, but also make sure the, the, those fees get reinvested in the field. Or, or, so or we'll maybe, go with Carmela and then, okay. and then Ben, we can come back to Ed. And, and then after Ben, we go to Rob and then two feet. Um. I kind of got lost in this conversation because I, I'm remembering, uh, you know, about the fees being backed out uh, a long time ago um, out of the fundraising issue. Um, and I, I just want to make one comment. I mean, we're all, it's all going to one thing. I mean, the first item on this ord ordinance says that the user fees are going to go for the debt service. And that's one of the things that the MAF has uh, said, hey, listen, we're, we're going to fundraise $900,000 for you, and that's where it's going. So it, it's, it, it's, you know, and, and we talk about public trust. I mean, this is something we told that the borough of Madison and all the residents wasn't going to cost the taxpayers a dime. So, you know, I, we, we can't go there, you know. I mean, th this, is, this is a very important um, ordinance at, at this point is you've got to have structure and there is no structure right now as far as user fees and whatever. We can't be on the same plane as people coming into this borough and utilizing fields that we're, we're paying for to maintain and whatever. So uh, I think it's a, it's a good ordinance um, and I think it's a necessary one right now. And just to clarify, I don't think there was ever official action by the council that said that it was, it was uh, no taxpayers' money or anything. Right. There, there were, certainly were c comments and people trying to work in that direction, but it was never an official mm -hmm. uh, action by the council. Right. Ben and then Rob. Yeah, then Bob. All, all I wanted to add to it is um, that I was one of the participants when we spoke to the MAF as to what would be reasonable objectives in their fundraising and we spoke explicitly about the fees, and these numbers and this procedure is something of mutual agreement. It wasn't as if the council said, this is what you must do. Quite the contrary. We asked, what do you feel comfortable doing? And then there was a side discussion about how the fees would be counted, and as I recall, it was not a big issue at the time, and, uh, uh, you know, this, this document reflects what I recall from that discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> Rob? When I was at the meeting with Ben, and I recall similar things, but I believe there's an open question, and the open question is, are you going to reserve this money for the returfing of the field in the future? Because I know that that, that, that had been, that that uh, suggestion had been floated. So under this ordinance, Will money be reserved to pay for a returfing of the, uh, of the, or uh, reskinning of the field in the future, or will it, in fact, every year go to pay down debt or cover the emergency operations, as Jim suggested, and like if something rips? So I, guess, I guess I can't. So if, if, if in fact, this is going to go to pay down debt and to keep a small buffer in case we have a rip or something like that, I can support it. If, however, we're going to ask the users today 
to pay fees and also to pay open space tax because remember much was made uh, about the, the necessity to rate to increase the open space tax to cover this um, only to have that money put away so that 10 or 12 years from now future residents and future users won't have to pay the retail turf field uh, I, I, I don't I don't see how that's a consistent argument with what's been made in the past so can Jim can you answer or I, I think I, I can think answer that I, I think if you if you look at the construction of it it says use for debt service Operation and maintenance. Um, I don't think that maintenance, if you look at Green Acres and all the different uh, court decisions, I don't think that re um, skidding an entire field would qualify as maintenance. And I think that'd be a violation of this ordinance. Um, it'd probably also be a violation of Green Acres. So I think that unless this ordinance is amended to have replacement, I mean, if the word replacement is in there, I, I would say that your concern is valid. But I think you're very safe with the thing, operation and maintenance. Maintenance really um, connotes repairing something if it's damaged. Um, you know, we had a situation in my town where, where the field got damaged at night through vandals, uh, yep. the end zone. So they had to replace the end zone piece of it. And that's what this, that was intended for. So, so then if I, my back down a little calculation is right. Um, if we're going to raise somewhere between forty and seventy-five thousand dollars a year between user fees and field rentals, which I believe is a conservative number, and right now the total uh, outstanding debt service on the bonded portion of the field is approximately one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, give or take. With applying this money to there, would then reduce the amount of open space funds that are being used to pay for the turfing of the field to approximately fifty or sixty thousand a year. Does that seem like a legitimate? back to the envelope calculation? Oh, <laughs> I like to see it on the screen in a spreadsheet myself. <laughs> well, well, I mean, right? I mean, it's, okay. so, so it's not hundreds of thousands a year for the right. chirping of the field. Excellent. Okay. I can support this, I think. Okay. Bob? Okay, uh, we've, this has been talked about for so long, I, you know, I could almost do it in my sleep. Um, to a few of Ed's points. Uh, the original presentation done by the MAF showed a much higher obligation that they had to fundraise. <clears throat> and I know you and I talked briefly about it. That obligation was dropped down when we said, you know, as Carmela pointed out, the money for the user fees needs to be collected by the borough and put aside for debt service and maintenance. So that number then did come down to about, I think, 900000 or eight seventy five. So I'm very comfortable with that piece of it. In regards to the money that's going to be collected every year, um, one thing that I had wanted to do, but and I know this goes against what a lot of people are suggesting, and I'll, I'll, I'll give on this point, is I was in favor originally of saving up the money for the future reskinning of the fields for the simple reason that you know, we talk about 10 or 12 years, odds are those fields are going to have to be reskinned much sooner. And if you don't have the money put aside for it, you're going to have to bond. And that'll be putting a, a burden on, yeah, okay, it's going to be a future user of the field, but if you really sit back and think about it, I have a friend who has a young child right now in first grade. In eight years, that kid's going to be in high school. They'll still be living in this town. So they'll now have to pay for a bond at presumably a much higher interest rate. So whatever we can do to reduce that, but that's not going to happen. This money will be put aside for maintenance, which is fine for emergency repairs, and while I fully expect the MAF to raise the money, there could be instances where they're going to fall short. And rather than throw that shortfall on the taxpayer, you need this buffer to help cover that shortfall in the fundraising. So the way it's structured right now, it's good. I wish that we could have saved up the money to go back to the old Madison principle of pay as you go and put the money aside first, but this project is what it is, and that wasn't done when this project was first put together. So I'll support this as is right now. Yep. Can I go back? Yep. Okay. So, so I still saying that this is, is and I, I, I'm not part of the discussion, uh, as far as no taxable event, I don't, and 
maybe the council didn't didn't say that, but that was out on the street, and it wasn't corrected by the council to anything I remember. So as a Joe citizen, I see that as it, as as still there. As far as putting money away for the ripped up field, possibly in seven or wear out field, we don't do that now with capital equipment. We don't make buckets for capital, you know, the fire truck, it goes on the capital plan. And so I would like to see that the fees that are collected for the rental of this property go against what MAF has obligated to. So if there, this is $50,000 that it goes to what MAF has committed to. In, in a way, that's already done because we took away that, they took that off their list to raise again. So, so this is the, the, the 50,000 a year is going to be? If, if, we, if we were to say we go to their obligation, we've got to go back and raise their obligation because we took it away from their obligation. The, the okay. other, one other thing is we used Green Acre funds, a portion of it for that site. And a lot of this ordinance is in compliance with the Green Acre regulations which codifies what you can and can't charge for field usage fees on Green Acre sites. So for example, once you use Green Acre funds, you can't have an exclusive right to that field. You can charge reasonable fees and they can be different, but it's all mandated. And the way you were doing it before, it wasn't codified. So that, that was problematic. And since it is being funded with state funds, we have to comply with the Green Acre statutes. Okay. Any other comments? I'll just, uh, because I would have also loved to see this res create a reserve for reskinning at some point, but uh, we'll deal with that at some other point. Because what will happen to a future co uh, council is they will have a, you know, it'll be a Pomeroy Road residents, for example, <laughs> sitting here as they're discussing trying to reskin the field, and they'll be talking about their road is up for reconstruction again, and that council will have to balance that as opposed to an earlier council saying, we're putting money aside, so there is no choice in the future. This field will be taken care of but with a fund. But we'll, we'll cross that bridge or play that game on the field another time. So this ordinance uh, 45 is listed for introduction tonight with the hearing in our second meeting this month. So um, ordinance amending chapter 163, smoking to prohibit smoking on all borough property, including public parks and recreation areas. Carmela. Thank you. Um, this is an amendment. Um, in 1993, uh, there, there, was, um, there was an ordinance that was passed by the Madison Borough Council banning smoking in public buildings, etc. Uh, one of, uh, one of the, one of the uh, projects that the Madison Alliance Addressing Substance Abuse has worked on is to amend this uh, uh, chapter 163 that's been in existence since 1993 and to um, uh, say that there is no par smoking in any public parks or recreation facilities. Um, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's a good amendment. Um, it, it's going to ensure the protection of our residents and the children uh, of Madison from secondhand smoke and diseases. Um, one of uh, the great parts of this is that um, it, it will go towards points of our sustainable um, uh, goals that we have in Madison because um, going smoke-free actually makes commu uh, communities green. Um, we worked with um, a, a very nice organization that's called um, GASP, and we have two representatives here uh, tonight, um, Alan Kantz and Lucille Talbot and the mayor has, has given me permission to invite them up just to say a few words and um, you know, talk about uh, the other communities that are following this, and a lot of them are our neighboring communities, and also to show the sign that we'll, they will supply that will go on each one of our recreational fields. So if you'd like to come up. As you step to the microphone, you know, state your name and your affiliation. Sign in also for us. Hi, my name is Alan Kantz. Uh, I'm a program manager at Global Advisors on Smoke Free Policy in Summit, New Jersey. 
Hi, my name is Lucille Talbot, and I am a public health educator <coughs> for the Morris and Somerset County Cancer Coalition. And we've, we've been working with municipalities and counties uh, in northern Jersey on smoke-free parks. And so we wanted to briefly explain why, why we're excited about smoke-free parks, what's going on in the area, and then talk about some of the potential advantages of smoke-free parks for Madison in particular. Um, so right now across the state of New Jersey, there are over 210 municipalities that have some, municipalities and counties that have some sort of um, smoke-free parks rule or regulation <coughs> ordinance. And out of those 210, over 120 of them have made their parks 100% smoke-free, which is similar to what Madison is considering now. Um, and so we've, we've seen that a big surge in these smoke-free parks ordinances over the course of the, maybe the past year and a half, um, and, and we're excited to see it come to this area. Um, already, uh, Chatham Borough and Township have both made their parks 100% smoke-free. Um, now, why, why are municipalities interested in doing this? Well, uh, they see big benefits to, first of all, uh, as the council president mentioned, um, it's a green policy. Uh, typically, cigarette butts are, are the number one or one of the top forms of litter in a park. Um, they're also, when they start out in the park, they end up washing into waterways and ending up on our beaches. And year after year, we see cigarette butts and other tobacco litter are among the, the top forms of, of litter found on beaches. Uh, in addition to being green, uh, smoke-free parks are also good for public health. Uh, smoke-free parks send a message to, to children in a municipality that um, smoke-free is the standard, that that's, that's what we expect. We expect kids today to grow up smoke-free. Um, and so by having the, the municipality that has set aside certain land for healthful activities, for recreation, for enjoying the outdoors, making that land smoke-free sends a message to kids and, and helps um, keep these areas that are, are supposed to be for healthful activities healthy. Um, now, as, as the council president mentioned, there's also a benefit to a sustainable Jersey application, and I know Lucille wanted to talk about that. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to just say thank you very much for allowing us to say a few words on behalf of the um, the uh, Cancer Coalition also, in addition to GAS. But um, the Cancer Coalition is committed to reducing the incidence of cancer and also um, the burden that cancer has on our communities. So reducing uh, smoking in our communities and reducing secondhand smoke in our communities is one of our major goals. Uh, I think that uh, the council president already mentioned that there is an advantage to Madison to maintain and sustain its uh, green status for a sustainable New Jersey, but it also uh, keeps our parks clean. And I think the most important thing is that we're trying to um, set social uh, norms for our children so that they don't see people smoking in recreation areas. Now, let, let me take this opportunity to, to talk about these signs. So one reason we've seen municipalities work on, on smoke-free parks in the last year and a half in particular is the New Jersey Department of Health has made these signs available. Uh, now these are uh, these are metal, 100% smoke-free public property signs. Uh, the state provides them to municipalities that makes their parks make their parks 100% smoke-free, free of charge. Uh, and the when you get the sign, you'll notice there's this blank space down here. Uh, they also provide a sticker that you put there. So most municipalities order a sticker that has the ordinance number to make sure that. If in the, in the rare situation where a police officer needs to write up a citation to someone because they were flagrantly violating the rule, um, they, they have the ordinance to write to. Um, you can also use this to provide other information. So, for example, some municipalities have, have put uh, no fumar, a, a Spanish translation, down here. Um, or if there's other information you want to convey, for example, um, I know there was talk at the Board of Health meeting last night about potentially mentioning here that electronic cigarettes are considered smoking under the under a, a possible change in the rule. So you can <coughs> write that on here. You have, I've talked to the sign printer and they say you have up to three lines on this sticker. Uh, so that those stickers come with it, so you just tell us what you want on the sticker and we, we get that, and usually it arrives about two weeks after we put in the order. 
Uh, so yeah, these, these signs have been kind of an exciting addition because it gets rid of the, the small but always noticeable financial barrier to, to making a change in policy, and because we find that signs are incredibly important to making the policy effective. The experience from New York City when they, when they implemented their smoke-free parks and rec areas was, was that just by putting up signs and having their public notice campaign, uh, they then had an entire year of no active police enforcement where a police officer couldn't write you a ticket for violating their policy. But they studied the amount of uh, cigarette butt litter in parks before and after that year of policy in effect with zero enforcement. And they found that the amount of cigarette litter was reduced by about 50%. So just by having good <coughs> public notice so people knew what the rule was, they tended to follow the rule. So that's why we, we think it's great these signs are available. Um, signs are on a first come, first serve basis. So you tell us how many signs you need and we make sure you get those signs. Thank you. Be, Thank you uh, before much. we go to discuss discussion, any uh, questions for our presenters here? Okay. Thank you very much. We Appreciate do, we your. We also have a, a packet here if the council members wanted to put ten copies here. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Carmelo yeah. and then uh, Rob. Yeah. You could leave them right here, Alan, if you want, and then we'll get them to okay. everybody. So Carmelo, Carmelo, did you have anything else? No, no. We um, they they were at the board of health meeting last night, and um, they were very enthusiastic about it. Um, the Masa group is very enthusiastic uh, because the, um, the school is 100% smoke free, and that's another sign that I'm going to try and get out of Alan and his uh, group as well, so that um, uh, the board of education can uh, do that. But. Um, I think we should be very proud of Madison because uh, we were way ahead of the curve in 1993 passing the, this type of ordinance and, and just amending it all the way through. So um, that was one of the things that I learned from this group. So it's good. Ben? Right. Or, Rob, did you, did you have your hand down? You. No, yeah, so I'm just going to say, um, you know, from personal experience, when I, when I graduated from college, I, I moved to California for my first job. And, I remember in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, New York, when you went to a restaurant, you ordered a Coke, they gave you a regular Coke, and they sat you in smoking. In California, they gave you a Diet Coke, and they sat you in non-smoking. And that was the standard. And five years of that, and, and you never want to sit in smoking or drink a regular Coke again. So I, if we can start it early, I think we should. I fully support this. Ben and then Bob. I, I'm supportive of this, but I do, I do have a question about the implications for enforcement. What, do we have a penalty well, we in mind? About How will this be we, we talked about enforcement, and um, I, you know, if somebody is smoking in, in one of the recreation fields, um, and you know the signs are up, and we're we're going to try and do some education <coughs> regarding this. I mean, we're we're not, we're not going to get on our cell phones and pull up a cop and, and have them uh, give us some and some whatever. I one of the things that I think is that there's lots and lots of children in in um, around that just despise the, the whole concept of smoking, okay? And I, I think that they probably won't have a problem, you know, going up to an adult and saying, why are you smoking here? Can't you yep. read? Or whatever, <laughs> you know? But, um, you know, uh, I was a smoker a long time ago, and I found, you know, uh, this time of the year, there was always, uh, on my dinner plate when I came home from work, was uh, a lot of literature about non-smoking. So. <laughs> You know, I, I know that this could be done. And we're hoping that what people do is if they see somebody else smoking, you know, they just say, please, you know, we, we want healthy children. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, please stop doing that. It's not allowed. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Up. And then I'll be Ed. brief. Um, I attended Sustainable Madison with Council President uh, Vitali. And one thing that really impressed me was how many communities in this state are already doing this. Yeah. That was a very impressive number. So uh, to that extent, I think they were wise, and I think we're wise in adopting it as well. And what was mentioned is the health of the children. Um, I've seen too many people go to the hospital with uh, emphysema and uh, respiratory problems, and I think this will, should go a long way to maybe help reducing that. So this is long overdue, and I think it's worthwhile adopting. Ed? All right. I think this is almost a no-brainer. I fully support it. Anything to to create a more healthy environment for our kids and our community is uh, you have my support on it. 
And I'll just throw in one extra thing about, you know, the number one use of our sports, um, our <coughs> parks are for youth sports, uh, which is a very positive experience for uh, children. And um, I think a lot of times coaches and parents in the stands underestimate the influence they have. And it hit me back in my days of Coach Bob when um, I saw Mark, who I had in many classes at the Y, dressed in a tie one day, and I asked him, you know, where was he going? And he <coughs> didn't say anything. He looked very embarrassed. His mother came up to me later on and said, Mark saw you wear a tie yesterday, and he insisted on wearing a tie today. Yeah. And so that is the impression and the small, the subtle things that happens on our sports fields by positive reinforcement from our adults. So mm -hmm. I think that's, thank you for doing this, and I think it will help that. And so this is um, Ordinance 46 that is listed for introduction tonight. And now we are on to uh, some of the things that people from Academy Road have stated here for is the appropriation of funds from 27 Bellu Avenue property sale. Rob, this is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Yep. So um, now, of course, the, the property hasn't closed yet. So this is uh, uh, so this will have to be done uh, when the sale closes. Um, but even as far back as this year's budget process, um, uh, we were talking about the uh, capital requirements, and um, <coughs> I asked if we could uh, instruct the engineer uh, to prepare plans for Vinton, at least. I knew that we had some plans for Academy already in case we received the windfall. Uh, from At that time, the state, we were expecting money back for Sandy, so that if, in fact, we got the uh, the money, uh, we would be ready to go. Um, you know, we, we have had this priority list for some years. Uh, Vinton and Academy both have been at the top of the priority, have been on this priority list near the top for the past several um, uh, go-rounds of this. Uh, I, in speaking with the engineer and, and, and with the work we've done on the Construction Review Committee, we don't anticipate that the, the road um, uh, uh, priority will shift next year. So in an effort to uh, ensure that the work gets done, I'm requesting that upon successful uh, completion of the sale of Bell Avenue, not only do, do we move the money uh, to capital, but we actually encumber it uh, for use uh, road reconstruction for Academy and Vinton. Uh, the, the estimate for both is uh, roughly $535,000. Uh, I believe we're going to take in $462,000. We're a little short, but I think it will go a long way to uh, uh, to catching up on the priority list, um, you know, on the roads, and, and follow through on something we spoke about earlier in the year. Um, and if anyone has four hours they want to kill, you can go and watch that budget session on uh, on, uh, on on RoseNet <coughs> and see we actually spoke about it then. I, I believe there is precedent for this. Uh, there have been occasions in the past where we have moved money uh, to capital uh, based on the sale of project, uh, uh, the sale of a property uh, late in the year, and then there has also been uh, instances where um, DPW liaisons, throughout the normal course of their uh, their, their 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 activity, uh, have actually come up with an identified roads and funding. Uh, outside of the standard capital project uh, session early in the in, in the budgeting session, so I don't, I don't think it's anything groundbreaking. We've done it before, um, and I'm requesting that we make good on our promises and uh, take care of these two roads. As you can see, according to the draft sheet, uh, Vinton and Academy are again very near the top on the road project. So my idea was not only to move it to capital, but also to encumber it to ensure that the roads get repaired. Um, just to re reinforce part of that is certainly the practice has been in previous years that a um, sale of property has gone to capital as I often put it that any offloading of property should be balance sheet neutral sell an asset create an asset by uh, putting it back in capital so that's certainly is. one more thing I'm sorry yeah. um, for those of you who can't see Mr. Ryan is wearing a hat for the uh, USS Benjamin Franklin which was a very storied uh, warship in the Second World War. Uh, it was actually hit by a kamikaze plane and then nearly sunk with a loss of 800 souls uh, very close to the Japanese mainland. And I want to go out of my way to thank him for his service 
and let him know how honored we feel that a veteran of uh, that uh, courageous ship uh, came to speak to us tonight. I think it's worth noting. It's a, a very story. And much to his, also his brother, Joe, who was lost in the war. Comments? Bob? Um, when I saw this on the agenda, Rick, I did actually take a ride there. And the road is in pretty bad shape, and so the sidewalks. Um, but I did hear something tonight which did bother me, that promises were made and they're not fulfilled. And that I don't think you should ever do. Um, I think we have to do a couple of things here. One is let's get the money in house first. And then um, let's make sure that the money is there to do both that road and Vinton Road. Okay? And then the other piece I want to add to it is this. Um, there are some other roads in town that also need attention. And I'll, this kind of goes back to what I believe Maureen Burns said. You know, you can't do work by just reacting, all right? Um, I think we have to look at Keep Street because that is a main service road to the library, and that, along with Belmont, uh, needs to be done. And I also think we have to look at Kinney Street, which is off of Park Avenue, because while I'm not an engineer, my suspicion is that there is a very, there's a severe lack of curbing there. And during a heavy rain, there could be water issues on that street as well. So I think all these need to be put in the pot. Um, I do believe that Academy, even above Vinton, needs to be looked at and be put way up high on the list of priorities. Um, I do ride the ambulance. I have been on that street in an ambulance, and you do go for a nice bumpy ride, um, which I don't particularly like. And I think we have to put it all in the pot and see which which needs to get done first. Thank you. Osprey, then Thank Ben, then Ed. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree uh, <clears throat> with what you've said, um, and um, Mr. Catalanello, that we have to take responsibility for projects that we began. And I think as a council, um, when we start discussing the 2014 projects, we should have established a policy. I thought when I was on council a couple years ago that we had already done this, that if you say you were going to um, do water main replacements, mm -hmm. then within three years you have to commit funds from the general capital <coughs> to make sure the road is paved. So I, th I think that needs to be part of our um, decision-making policy, and we need that policy in place. Um, totally so that we encumber funds from general capital when we encumber the funds from the water utility. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. That's a very good point, and um, it's almost in, I feel bad that we're still discussing that. At this I time. know. Yeah. I yeah. can't believe we are. Yeah. I, I was, like, surprised. Yeah. Well, it's, it's sort of reminiscent of uh, when Oscar and I were walking the streets. We walked on Green Avenue and got yeah. an earful about how long Green Avenue had been a work in progress. Uh, I'm very supportive of the notion that the money be put to capital and be used for uh, projects of this type. We've been doing that now for the last several years where fund balance and non-recurring uh, revenue sources have made up the, 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 the lion's share of our capital account. Um, I am very concerned about two things. One is this, the proper setting of priorities and secondly, how we're communicating with with people in this, who live in this town. I mean, it's amazing to me that you could live on a street and have been promised that something would be changed for you, and six years later, you all are coming to a council meeting to tell us about it. I, I have to say that I, um, I give you all a lot of credit. You're much nicer to us than I would be if I were in your seat. But having said all that, I, I, one of the things I'm focused on, and we'll talk about momentarily, is coming up with a process so that when you ask the question about my street and where does it stand, you will get an answer and you'll get a commitment. I think this is long overdue as a process, and I see you are very close to the top, and uh, you know I certainly have no problems uh, going ahead with the project, assuming as we go through these, you know, we we maintain the same prioritization. Good. Thank you. Um, 
now that I'm retired, I get to ride my bike a lot more. And I did go over these streets today. Uh, I did also go to the utilities and everything. Got a good workout today. These roads need a lot of work. And, uh, and we're talking about dates that go back a long time. And I tell you, if my road was torn up that long, I would have been in here a lot, lot sooner. Uh, and it's validated because they're the top ones on the list, or the second and third one on the list. And I think we're already working on Rosedale, as, or Ridgedale as we talk, or will be done. So I, I can certainly support it. And, and I see it as uh, maybe correct and wrong that we let it go as a, as a, a body of a government body that we haven't addressed this sooner. And um, that's my comments. Just, Carmelo, you haven't, yeah. uh, and then Bob. And um, I, I, I agree mind. with um, Austria. I think that one of the problems that we've had in the last couple of years is that being forced into projects you know, on a capital basis that kind of took us away from these road projects. Um, we, we've had some road collapses. We've had uh, some problems, um, you know, at, at the uh, substations and whatever that needed to be fixed. But I, I think that deviating from a project, you know, years ago we had 10-year uh, road project plans and we stuck to them, you know, and whatever it took at the time, you know, and then I, I'll use a really bad word that nobody really likes, but at one point when I was first on the council, way back in 2001, we felt the necessity to go out and bond for some of these roads because there were so many that were in disrepair that we had to, we had to make a decision about getting that stuff fixed. We can't deviate from this. And you know what I'd like to say to the borough engineer, no matter what, this, these are the projects that get taken care of first. You know, and you are on, uh, you know, you're, you're second and third here. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that, you know, this has happened to you over the years. Um, there's a lot you could say about the squeaky wheel. You know, I, you, you, sh you know, just keep on coming and pounding at us. You know, we'll, we'll keep on pounding the other way and make sure that it gets done. Bob? I just have a general question. Is this actually a list of priority order or is it just a general list of projects? It's a general list of projects. Which one? The engineer's prior recommendation, academy of the correct? Number one and two on the Okay. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you. And a clarification for Ridgedale, which is there. Ridgedale is currently under construction for water, water main, main replacement. Right. If we had to repave the same situation that we don't create now for Ridgedale that has been created in... A million bucks, right? It's a million dollars to repave curb that's to curb. To thinking about so that's another project down the road that we have to plan for. But in the scheme of things, <coughs> the engineer would concur that Vinton and Academy are our are, are yep. highest road reconstruction priorities. Okay, thank you. And, um, I'll throw in my comment and then we'll I'll see what we have uh, consensus mm -hmm. on. The, um, as I mentioned before, it is very important to uh, take a sale of property, reinvest it in capital, so we are reinvesting our infrastructure. But it's also re very important as we lay out a capital project plan for a year, we do it well thought out. We've, we've done it in years when we've had the funding to do it all, but we didn't have the manpower to get the projects done, raising false expectations. We've done it, we've made promises the other way around when we had the manpower and not, not the funding. And the issue we have, if, if we earmark funds for a particular project without talking about the whole year projects, the first group in here will be Fletcher, Durwood, mm -hmm. and that neighborhood because they, they've been here before. So that was, so we need to make sure, so there are no false under, understandings that yes, this needs to go back into capital and we need to confirm the full capital project, recognizing Vinton and Academy are near the top of the list. And certainly we are in a position with the prudent um, use of, you know, realizing Bellew Avenue did, was not a potential park or a service for the uh, borough that we could sell that off. So we've got this opportunity and I think we should, you know, plan it through thoroughly. So the one, we heard, you know, we got to sell the property first before we can do anything. And we will, the, the engineer will continue to refine the uh, priority list. I think we can 
get a uh, better list coming forward and we can revisit this, but I think most of it will be visited during the uh, budget process, the capital budget process next year. Yeah, we need not to deviate though either. Yep. You know, once, once we come to a priority list here, I, we, we can't deviate and that's what happens. Uh, and it's happened in the last couple yeah. of years, sir. So. And whether it's a, kind of leading into our last topic item, which, we, which we're not there yet, strategic planning is whether something comes out of there that the idea water project has to be approved at the same time that either the road reconstruction or mill and overlay depending on the, the status of the road. To tear up a road and not have the plan to come back in a timely manner is not a good plan. Just, just, just to point out though, I've been on council for three years um, and these, these roads have been near the top um, for those three years. We asked the engineer and the department heads to give us a, a list of projects in priority order as opposed to each department listing its number one priority independently. We all kind of got together yeah. as a review committee and we tried to rank order them. So I believe that Vinton and Academy are priority roles and, um, you know, unfortunately when we first uh, when I first got here, the main concern was this: were the pump was North Street Pump Station and West End and Treadwell and Candlewood, and, and you know we were near Calamity there, so we got a little behind on the roads because we wanted to, you know, we, we didn't want to have a cholera outbreak here in, in Madison. <laughs> it's not good for real estate values at all. Um, but uh, you know, so, so uh, we would have loved to continue doing the roads. We had to fix the sewers, and you know, I just feel it's important that. You know, th I believe Bob when he says, you know, what, and th that this is the priority list, and um, you know, so I'm in favor of actually encumbering the money because I want to make sure that it actually gets spent on on the streets and, and not, you know, not something else. Right. That's just yeah. And and to re but we first can't encumber it until we have it. I right. Can't, can't, we won't have it for a couple more. And, and the other is encumbering it before we have a plan for our full project. Not, full project load for next year. Not that we wouldn't do these roads, but to all of a sudden say, these roads are gonna be done, Fletcher, you're in limbo. It'd be far easier to say in 2014, these are the projects that will be done because this is the funding we have. And um, you know, as you, you pointed out, a, a very good, made a very good point about the struggle that this council, future councils and previous councils always have to deal with that you have a plan and set in place. And I'm sure of many of those council members that told you 2007 it will happen, said it with their heart and feeling that it could happen. Sewers go bad and all of a sudden the council is faced with, oh my God, there's a different priority. 2012, we did not do a single mill and overlay in this town because we decided that was a secondary priority to those projects. But that was a dis tough decision, a decision that had to be made, but it also meant that it pushed off more pressure into the future years. So that's what councils all, always have to deal with. Um, and we try to maintain this beautiful town as best as possible, and we will continue to do it. And certainly appreciate all the Academy Road people coming out tonight. So it is one of my many favorite roads in Madison, but it is near and dear to my heart, and uh, we will uh, work this through. All right, let's move on to uh, grant approval, open space, trust fund for capital improvements, the James building. Uh, Mayor, I'll, I'll start. I'll straight, yeah. um, uh, we had a request um, by the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts um, for open space funding and historic preservation funding um, for the capital improvements. The, the open space uh, recreation historic preservation yeah. trust fund committee uh, made, uh, passed a resolution last Wednesday uh, right. suggest, uh, recommending to the council that $125,000 be approved to begin the repairs. Tonight we have Vivian James of the director of the museum. We've got a uh, PowerPoint presentation um, just to go over the different phases because this is a, a several phase project and they will be turning to the borough and the open space trust funding for continued funding. Uh, but the, 
the point, the, the large, they're leveraging money, yeah. grant money from other sources with the, the small amount we will be giving them. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Vivian James. I'm the director of the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts. And I just wanted to fill you in on some of the details about our request tonight. That's superstition. Got to have an even number of slides. Um, many of you know uh, the James Public Library building uh, was constructed in 1899 um, and concluded construction in 1900. Um, it was gifted by D. Willis James and his wife Ellen. Um, it's built in the Romanesque Revival style. Um, it was taken over in 1969 um, when the library outgrew the building uh, by the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts and we've been there ever since. Um, and in 1997 was the last time that we had major repairs done to the building where we actually raised about $2 million of which the borough at that time was a, a contributor and um, I think it was a, a challenge grant of about $250,000 that we were awarded and that we, um, we succeeded the challenge because of the residents of Madison. So thank you very much for that. Um, Currently, we have uh, a, a big problem with water. And like all old buildings, uh, you constantly have to keep up and do repairs to them. And uh, ours is no different. And we have found that we have water coming in from just about every orifice available in the building. Um, we have an issue with prior repairs. You can see over here, uh, we have concrete patches that were installed and they tend to actually hold in the water and create additional spalling. Um, over here on this part of the building, um, it, it was actually a, a form of caulk that was used instead of mortar. So the caulk is plastic. So imagine putting a sheet of plastic in front of a brick wall and expecting it to breathe. So we have a number of situations like this throughout the building. Um, and then we also, uh, the result is that when we have these penetrating water sources uh, coming through the exterior of the building, uh, they seep in through the mortar. And the white that you are seeing is the salt leaching in from the water. And it creates a kind of a popping effect the mortar deteriorates and the popping just comes right off. And if you've been in the building, you know that the entire building is covered in hand stenciled historic uh, stencils. Uh, so it's something that we really want to keep because it's one of the greatest features of the building. Um, we also have been experiencing it in the areas of the building that don't have painted brick. Um, and to a much more detrimental, um, this is the inside of the clock tower, which is one of the uh, more drastically affected areas. And all of the white that you see is as a result of all of the water that's been leaching through. And in some areas, if you're in the clock tower, uh, the brick is actually concave because so much of the surface of the bricks has fallen, um, has basically deteriorated. So, you know, right now it's not in any danger of, uh, you know, becoming a structural hazard, but the potential is there. Um, other places that water comes through the building are uh, classic. Um, we have undersized gutters, um, and along with some incredibly huge overhanging trees, um, the trees just basically throw uh, leaves in our gutters, which are already undersized, and the water comes straight down the roof, and you've seen we have these tremendous rooftops, straight down the roof, and over the lip of the gutter, and then kind of falls in a sheet on the side of the building, which it's, it's just bad placement, and um, uh, you know, we, uh, I think at this time, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the si we were limited um, because the historic size of the gutters were undersized and were historic building, but we have enough ammunition on our side to correct that. Uh, and then um, we also have water issues in the basement. 
Um, you know, we have rising damp coming through. Um, we were fortunate that we didn't have flooding uh, from Sandy, but we actually did have flooding from Irene. Um, but essentially water enters the building um, from any, any accessible point. So uh, when we noticed all of these issues um, in about 2011, we, uh, we reached out to the Morris County Historic Trust Fund and uh, applied for funding to take some action. So, so far we have completed the historic preservation study, um, which is this giant telephone book here. So it's incredibly thorough and our chairman Tom Judd spoke to you before about some of the different uh, uh, new and innovative technologies that were used to help diagnose the building because when we first discovered these problems, we looked back and found that there had been a series of architectural studies that had been done and I could actually identify unlabeled parts of the building based on the fact that the same exact damage had been reoccurring and reoccurring. So uh, we went with this award-winning firm, uh, Historic Building Architects, because they kind of had this CSI approach to trying to figure out exactly what the problem was and uh, through science and create an actual solution, whereas we had had so many reports of people being like, you've got some water coming in. We've just got to cock it up. And so this way we actually have uh, some uh, science-backed reasons and solutions. So we're excited about that. Um, the other thing that they did, which we really appreciated, was they did it in a multi-phased, affordable way for us because uh, the sum of all of these repairs is about $2 million. So for an organization whose budget covers around $300,000, $2 million is huge. So uh, she was able to, our architect was able to divide the project up into kind of bite-sized fundable pieces that we could then work um, trying to raise the funds for. But in the meanwhile, we didn't have to say wait 10 years for the building to deteriorate further until we could raise the entire sum. We're now able to work on the building much sooner than we had uh, ordinarily thought we would. Um, and then uh, the most recent uh, activity that's happened is that we completed the construction drawings for phase one. Um, the project is divided into three phases and phase one is of the projects that are the most dire and necessary. Um, so we're excited that we are basically a construction ready project. Um, we just need the funding. And so you can see that this is an example of some of the, uh, some of the uh, work contained in this giant preservation study. And then this here is an example of some of the ways they visually presented the prioritization needed um, of needed repairs. Um, you can see purple is urgent and immediate work, and that would be um, the tower picture that I showed you, the brick. Um, the tower is a major source of water leaks coming through in, into the building. So that's on the list, and you can see we've got a lot of purple, and of course, um, she included some of the, the gutters and the coping stones. Um, and then this is an example of one of the many drawings that we have for the project, which again is uh, ready to move forward. We just, we just need the funding. So moving forward, um, we have already have established the partnership with Morris County Historic Preservation Trust Fund. Um, they are just, I think, one of the greatest things about Morris County. Um, I actually live in Essex County, so it's, uh, you know, one of these great things that keeps the county, um, you know, one of the meccas of history in the state. Um, they, their program is an 80-20 matching grant program. So the museum is responsible for coming up with 20% and then they will match it 80%. And so that is part of the reason that we're here tonight is to help us get to that 20. Um, so basically for every, um, for every $100,000 project, the county will provide 80,000 
and the museum will provide uh, 20,000. So, and because we've already received two grants from them, they, um, they kind of believe in multi-stage uh, multi phasing, and we've completed the first two st uh, stages, so we're confident that they are going to see this project through to the end. Uh, you know, and they also already let us know that they, uh, they feel that we will become a role model for how other organizations should deal with stone masonry buildings. <laughs> so, which I don't know whether or not to be flattered or, you know, oh, woe is me. But um, on this screen, it's a little hard to see. Um, okay, you have paper copies, and I also discovered why I'm not an engineer. There was a math error in the original copy uh, because I altered the ratio. Um, I was off. So you'll notice that where um, I had, uh, I think I had 60. 80, 20 actually is 75. So, but the bottom line number is still the same. But, so I just corrected my math. Um, so um, I had been asked to kind of project uh, a series of requests of how many requests it would take for us to you know, make some progress. Um, so I did a, kind of a four-year breakout of what we expect to ask. And tonight we're here for the $125,000 $125, request, which we can then take and uh, receive a grant of about $300,000 from the Morris County Historic Trust. Um, we also, uh, there's an upcoming opportunity coming up from the New Jersey Historic Trust uh, for us to apply for a $15,000 grant. So uh, we figure with uh, use of the open space request of 125, we can apply um, an additional 35, uh, either directly to the project or use it to leverage additional grant opportunities. But in the case of um, a lot of the state ones, you don't hear about them until they release the funds. So we're hoping for additional funds to be released, but that will get us to about 400 and, sorry, I can't even read, uh, I need my glasses. $440,000, and we've been told by many of the contractors that we work with um, that it's to our best advantage to get, uh, if we're going to break the project out, to break it into chunks that are as close to $500,000 as possible, or else the quality of the contractor that we would attract um, when we go out to bid will go right down. And so we see no sense in getting more bad repairs <laughs> done to the building. Um, so we're really trying very hard to stick to that number. Um, you know, but um, you know, right now this is a kind of a plan of what we uh, see happening, um, best case scenario. But um, we are also, uh, because you saw that, I'm sorry, you may not have seen, that that plan got us to about 1.8 million. Um, and that's with the best case scenario, assuming that everyone funded us at the highest level. Um, in order to kind of make up for best case scenario, we have secured um, the aid of uh, Ruotolo Associates. Uh, they're a fundraising firm. Uh, they've done work in this community. Uh, one of the associates used to be, yeah, everybody's like, I know. <laughs> I think they did Thursday Morning Club. Um, they did the... Uh, Jersey Center for the Arts, and, um, and one of the vice presidents uh, fundraised at Drew for years. So, you know, they're a group that's familiar with the area, <coughs> familiar with the players, and uh, so we're hoping to reach out to them uh, because, you know, all of the funds that I showed you on the previous page can only be used for historic preservation, but we would also like <coughs> to um, expand our project into possibly um, upgrading our exhibits and um, fulfilling my personal dream of having a community room downstairs in the basement so that everyone who says, I've got this fabulous collection of quilts that my mother made, you know, can have a place that uh, they can put them up. Um, 
where we can have extra children and be able to expand our education activities for both children and adults, because right now we are physically limited by the number of kids we can have in the museum at one time. And also, um, I'm trained as a cabinet maker and a silversmith, and I don't dare do any of those things in the main gallery, the museum. And you know, in the state of New Jersey, we have so many different guilds and so many different trades um, that are currently being practiced, but we can, can't present any of them to the public um, because we have this gorgeous historic building. So if we have an actual working room that the community can use <coughs> and be a part of, that would be a great thing. But you know, that's, you know, that's a part of the money that we're also trying to raise in addition to uh, the historic preservation funds. Okay, well, I just, um, you know, I just really wanted to, to thank you all for everything that you already do for the museum. And as you can see, um, funds from the open space just provide us with a tremendous opportunity to just kickstart, um, you know, helping to preserve the building and getting the repairs underway. So we really appreciate your consideration. Uh, ben? Ben? Uh, I was a little confused by the numbers. Okay. If it's 80-20, uh, so you need 20% of that from some combination of um, open space funds and private donations? Or that's the part I don't, I don't quite get. They um, actually don't specify where this 20% has to come from. But you need 20% of, of the 2 million. We need 20% of the 2 million, um, 20% of the 2 million and the 20% that we would get from open space would help, would be leveraged by county funds. So the most you need from open space would be $400,000 over four years. Is that correct? I mean, it's 20% of 2 million? Well, no, and there are, there's another line of just project funds. So to help us get to that magic number of hitting uh, close to, as close to a half a million dollars as possible, so that we can attract better bidders. Right, and, and how much do you hope to raise privately? Well, we are only starting that study um, pretty much this December. Okay. So that's why I couldn't really put in those, uh, because who knows, as, as you pointed out, there's a lot of wealth in this town, so. Ed, go ahead. Let's get the root team. <laughs> so if you raise a lot on private money, then we can alter our requests. And then that would lower the demands on open space. Yes, because I mean, we recognize the borough does a lot of great things for us that we, we truly appreciate. So, I mean, Is there a big nut to get that uh, firm to work for you? Do you have to come up with a sizable number? To... I also got a grant for that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, but uh, we, you know, again, we're part of the purpose of having the firm is uh, really to help us tap into the private funds. Rob? Thank you. Um, I just want to say I think that the building is part of Madison's cultural heritage and it's important to us. Um, my question is this, that when I look at, when I followed your presentation, I noticed that there were projects out maybe as far as 10 years. This takes us out 40 years. Do you have an idea what the total restoration cost on the 10-year project is, and would, would you expect incremental open space funds from the borough for the complete project? One of the things that we're trying to work out now, because we didn't think that we would have an opportunity like this, um, because originally the way that she designed the project was with the thought of us really scraping together funds piecemeal. And so she wanted to give us a larger timeline to kind of make it more flexible. But we're trying to work out now how to compact the project because, um, you know, while the roof hasn't failed, it's going to need to be repaired. And if we already have all the scaffolding up, you know, there's no point of taking it down. Take, taking it down. So we're we're in the process of trying to re-envision re the timeline, but. Um, the one thing uh, that I, I should make note of is that um, she hired a, a professional firm that spe specifically does pricing out of these kinds of projects, and they include um, a certain amount for inflation. 
granted, we are already one year behind on this project. So, you know, there will still be some inflation, but um, the $2 million price is, uh, you know, inflation is uh, accounted so, for. So, if we compact million, it, and we whatever, it, give or take. So, it's not $4 million. It's not like there's another $2 million after this. No. This, this is, this is, no, this, this is the is, whole yes, shebang. The whole yeah. So I think I'm understanding it. It's the 10 years that been packed into four years, and the whole thing is $2 million. Gotcha. Before we go back to Ed, uh, we're okay. We're here. All right, back over on the side. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I got another question. Now, our open, does this consume a small percent of your our open, open space funds? No, no. I. And do we, no. two part question. Okay. How big of a, our open space funds are, and do we have the the remaining balance obligated to other entities, or do we have a just like capital? Right. Well, you were here then for the, the open space uh, presentation I made. Obviously, I'm sorry. That's I'm okay. Sorry. Can I get back to you on it because I I didn't bring the whole report oh, okay. on on the numbers. This is actually um, this number 125 is a significant number. Um, given what we have to do, put towards debt service, so I can sh I can break it all out to you. It but it doesn't leave a lot in the pot um, at the, the end of this year. Mm -hmm. um, it covers Bob Vogel's project, this project, and then there's going to be some a little bit left over to go into next year. But it, it, it's not. We're operating with not a big sum of money like we had been. Okay. For sure. Right. But I'll, I'll, when you I'll, say this year, you mean 2013, or are we talking about 2014? Okay. They're going to. Uh, they're going. The money we're going to. This will come out of 2013 open space trust fund. The money from the county that they're asking for will be coming from the county's 2014 fund. Okay. But I can. I can give you that whole report. Yeah. Thank you. That's Any fine. other questions to Vivian since it's past her bedtime? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. So uh, discussion. Thank you. I think we. Okay. Well, uh, if you'd like, I, I totally support obviously this project. I think that it's a good use of open space trust fund money, recreation and, pres and historic preservation trust fund money, and um, I, I hope that my fellow council members will support me. Bob. Yeah. As I will support it. Uh, you know, I'll echo what. Council McCallum, that all said, it is part of Madison. It's a beautiful building. I've been there many times, and as long as the money is in open space to do it, go for it. Any comments? Okay, we have resolution uh, 288, which is part of the consent agenda. Before we go to this last discussion item, I will uh, apologize to the audience. I try to set the agenda so that our discussion agenda items stay to two tapes, not going to the third tape, which we have already done tonight. I know it's um, the council volunteers and you're here, so we try to be more realistic, but it was a lot of important stuff. As we go into this next item, strategic planning process, what we're going to do, as I mentioned before, this will be a two-part item, which is good since the, uh, we're past 10 o'clock. So mm -hmm. we'll, Ben will present the general idea and we'll have a full discussion uh, at our next council meeting. Uh, just to give you a little background as we go to this is, uh, as I mentioned in my comments on New Year's Day, a goal for, uh, as mayor, was to start a strategic planning process. This, this is a process that's not easily done for a borough because there are things that are not necessarily in your control. And you are making a plan for multiple years, and who knows who will be sitting at the table in the multiple years. But as Yogi Berra once said, if you don't know where you're going, how do you know when you get there? So I think if we can set, the goal here is to set some guidelines and some, some path, knowing that the paths will change as we go through there. So please um, look at it, you know, make a note of your uh, comments and um, that you want to bring up. Also, I want to be clear that this is not an, suggesting an ongoing, you'll see a list of committees, it's not suggesting ongoing committees. This would be a group that would work uh, to stay within statute, we'd have to, uh, if we start in 2013, we'd have to reappoint them in 2014. Um, but once the plan is presented back to the council, we give them their little medals and we shake, shake their hands and send them on their way. 
So it is not an ongoing uh, committees that we are proposing here. And I'm getting very confused. As could I ask something? Um, and this is this is a bit touchy, and I might be uh, um, a little over concerned. But I'll piggyback on a conversation we had uh, last this, earlier this week. We want to make sure that we stay apolitical in this meeting. With that said, <clears throat> I got the the one of the uh, daily mailers from a, a particular party and one of their strong points of their platform is strategic planning. Then I walk in here and had here's strategic planning. In light of two things, your 530 flight, getting up early, and to be make sure that we are apolitical and this is not an extension of a campaign, I request that we postpone this presentation until after the election and after your flight. Well, be before I take one more, so um, I'll let you make a, a motion on that in a second, but just to be very clear, as, as I did state, this was brought up um, on my New Year's Day message. It was a, a theme in last year's campaign. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I, I recruited Ben Wolkowitz, who was elected and has a background in uh, strategic planning. So. Um, anything that is discussed here in, from uh, September to the first Tuesday in November can always be construed as po political, and that certainly is not the intent, and uh, well, we have a job at hand. So we, we have, if you want to make a motion, we'll see if there's a second, and then we'll go from there. I'd like to make a motion that this presentation is postponed until after the election, and I'll bring it to your attention that it's the second bullet point on the campaign. It's, 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 and it's uh, the it's, one that, that it's, hand landed. It's, it's a motion. Totally motion. Stick, stick, totally stick to the motion. I motion. Okay. To second. Ask. Okay. okay. So we have a motion is second. Now you can and finish it's just your comment. Not, not do it. Just postpone it until after the election. So it's very clear that this is not an extension of the campaign. Ostry? Um, Mayor, I'd like to say something. Um, I think I probably spent the most years of anybody currently serving on this council in municipal government, both the zoning board and, and the council. And, you know, I served on a lot of uh, Republican majority councils. And I'll tell you, up until recently, when you walk through that door, the label of Republican and Democrat is left there. And you come and you represent every single person in town. I never felt that I was treated differently or, or politicized um, any actions by any of the council members that I served with until recently. And I find this statement to be very offensive. Thank you. Okay. Are there, are there um, Bob and then Ben? Yeah. Um, I'm a little surprised, but that'd be quite candid. Um, if I recall, other candidates for office in this room have talked about strategic planning and this council has been called to task on strategic planning. Um, to have this presentation now after we've been told council meeting after council meeting after council meeting you need a five-year strategic plan, you need a five-year strategic plan and we're on the doorstep of starting the budget process um, the, I do not see this as being political. Um, and if you want to say it is, well, then it's political for both sides. So hence, it's a wash. Um, we're fulfilling our obligation to the citizens of Madison. Um, it's one of these things where I guess if you do it, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Well, I think it's something that needs to be done. The work has been put into it. If we go into the budget season and don't do it, then we're going to be called to task, well, why didn't you do it? Um, I wish I could have brought other literature from the other side with me tonight, because I will guarantee it talks about transparency, uh, planning, all the same stuff, uh, things that were mentioned at the podium before. Um, I see no reason why we can't 
have the presentation tonight, and then talk about it, finalize it next go around, and then go into the budget season with a good framework. To me, to make this a political statement right now, uh, quite frankly, is very transparent in terms of what's being attempted here. I don't like that at all. Ben and then Carmelo? Yes. Um, well, I admit to being naive because I was going to start my presentation by saying I think this is one of the few bipartisan issues I could be talking about. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I don't care that they said strategic planning in their literature. Pat Rowe came up and asked some questions that I was going to address as part of my presentation on strategic planning. I believe the Republicans have been in favor of strategic planning, as have the Democrats. I don't view this as an ownership issue where one party owns it and the other doesn't. And quite, quite, you know, just, I, I mean, if you want to go on record and say the Republicans are against strategic planning, no. then by all means. But if you're in favor of it, could we please have this discussion? It is overdue. We should have had it months ago. There are a variety of reasons why we have not had it up until now. And I can assure you that if someone wins on the basis of this presentation, <laughs> they're terrific. And I give them a lot of credit. I, I, but, I, I, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead. add one Wait. thing. As someone who's been here for not quite a year, I, I don't get as offended as easily, perhaps, as others. But I would agree. That was particularly offensive. Uh, uh, Carmela, and then we'll, we'll go to the vote on the postponing. Well, next to Austria, I think that I have a lot of experience in this town with a lot of different people. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, I pride myself on is being able to listen to everybody. And I'm looking and smiling at a couple people who know that's the truth. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to offer this at this point is that, you know, you, you've been kind of out of town and you, you don't know what has been going on and whatever. But when you sit here and you spend this many hours trying to do the very best that you can and you see things come up like uh, Bitten and Academy not being done, that falls back to a situation that there is no plan in place. And we've talked about this. You know, for the past year, and now it's getting done. And I, you know, with all due respect, listen, I've run a lot of campaigns, and if, if there was a blurb on one of them that got me in, particularly, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, as Ben said, God bless it, whatever it is. You know, this is something that Bob Conley talked about when he first became mayor. And we aggravated him because we had so much, am I right, Bob? You know, we've got to get the strategic planning going. And, uh, and Ostry uh, and Ben can uh, affirm to that. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm not going to take exception to it. I'm just going to think that you just don't understand what the process has been. And you get to learn who we are and what we want for this town, OK? That's it. So Rob has not had a bite of the apple, so we'll go to Rob and then to the vote. Thank you. Um, I, I think there has been a plan. I think there hasn't been money. Um, so, so to say that we've been running around like chickens with our head, heads cut off, I think is a huge disservice. I, I to, to, well, I just heard someone say there's no plan. And the reason that's why the reason the Academy of Bidden haven't been done, that's not the truth. The reason the Academy of Bidden haven't been done is because there wasn't any money. Right? And, and, and there were other parts of our infrastructure that were in <laughs> dire need of Take repair that context. took. I'm sorry. Can I finish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might not Carmella, finish. yeah. Carmella, um, please. Uh, you know, so there were other parts of our infrastructure that were in dire needs of repair. Um, I, I think our engineer does a good job. Uh, I think he's under huge amounts of demand from everyone. Uh, He's pulled in 50 different directions, so please don't say there has not been a plan, because that's, that's not accurate. Okay. Um, this is the first time I've seen this, showed up this morning. Uh, it cuts across um, every area, there, and there was no input from anyone. 
or I, I certainly didn't give any input. I wasn't contacted about it, which I guess is okay. So it was a bit of a surprise that it showed up. Right, Mr. Rebholtz is new. You know, let him. We're going to let him talk. So, isn't this the usual procedure? Uh, ben, ben, please. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take the. Uh... I, don't, I don't know if it's the usual procedure or not because typically, uh, when you when you put things in, uh, you're especially when it uh, when you put a gender X in, uh, people, other liaisons, uh, whose areas are uh, spoken about or affected are copied on on all sorts of uh, on, on on everything, and this just showed up this morning. So. I'm all for strategic planning, absolutely, everyone is. Um, but I think that the council chose Mr. Rebholz to uh, replace Gene, and if he had a question about this, we owe him the respect to hear him out. That's all I'm going to say. Oh. Everyone had one chance. I'm going to. Okay, I'm just going to say. I'm going to say something, and we're going to take go to the vote. Okay. Uh, one, I want to apologize. And, and Rob helped me, re, re, I have this one bullet point. It says reinforce and support current practices. And that's what I want to say. You know, this is not, a, as, as people will see shortly, this is not a, just a capital planning. This is multiple directions. Um, it is, we are a town that does much better job looking forward than most towns. That doesn't mean we can't do a better job. And so that was the intent. And there was no intent to um, hide anything with this, going out this morning, and I apologize for it. I, ben and I finalized it on Monday. I meant to uh, get it out Tuesday, and periodically my paying job gets in the way. Um, so that didn't get out in time, but I also felt comfortable with the fact that I was not causing a problem because the intent from when Ben and I met is, you know, for someone to get this PowerPoint and understand what's going on would be unfair. So it's far better to go through the PowerPoint presentation, set the table, and then people can you know, process it over the next week and a half when we come back here uh, a week from Monday to actually have a full discussion. So, um, Patty, if we can call the... So the motion is whether to postpone this agenda item to after the uh, election. Not to kill it, postpone oh, yes, it. Right. So, so we have and, a motion and a second. If I could say... No, I no, got, I, 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 I cut off... I got Sorry. both these things today. And is, is it coincidental? I, I don't know. But to be apolitical, all I'm asking is to delay. Uh, no, 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 I it's, said no discussion. No, no, yeah, just the motion. Ed, 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 please. Yep. You've got to call over a vote now. Yep. Okay. Mr. Catalanello. I'll say no. Mr. Landrigan. Is it no? It, it's a yes to postpone, no to um, would be we proceed tonight. And I'll say no. proceed tonight, no. no. That's a no. That's a no. Oh. Mrs. Vitale. No. No, uh, no, 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 no means that it will go for tonight. Yes. No means yes. Okay. No to the postponement. Ms. Bailey? No. Mr. Walkowitz? No. Yes. Okay. So with that, Ben, sorry for the delay. Please. Uh, no, it's quite all right. I'm getting used to it. Um, Good. The, all right. Maybe it's not the the most obvious bipartisan issue, but I thought it was. So let me begin and explain what's going on here and what we've been thinking with the understanding that I'm doing this so that my fellow council members will fully understand what we've been thinking, give their input, which I'm anxious to get. There are a number of issues here that are quite soft and not fully resolved. And anyone in the audience, whether you be watching this at home or actually here, if you have any comments, if you have any concerns, if you have any input, I'd like to hear from you. Now, we, we, it seemed to me initially we had a choice. We could have replicated what was done in 1990. At that time, there was a comprehensive strategic plan done for all of Madison. It's approximately 160 pages. It's wonderful reading. It's, it's a terrific job. A number of the things that were written in that present, in that plan, have in fact been adopted, and a number have not, which is to be expected. So one option was to redo it. <clears throat> Say, here we are in 2013, and we should begin a redo of what happened in 1990. Um, my own feeling was that it's, it, it lost something in its comprehensiveness. We're better off with a more targeted plan, 
And so in just tossing out some ideas, we came up with what I believe are four key areas. Now, you may feel that one of them isn't very key, or I left off one of your favorites. Let me say, I don't see this process as a one-time process. I think once we've gone through these four key areas, we can revisit other areas and probably take some of the things we've learned in the first analysis to those other areas. Excuse the comment about... Can I just ask a question? Yes. I don't understand what an autonomous or semi... Or semi I was about to tell you. Yeah. Uh, that's a funny reference to all of the uh, strategic plans that are going on away from this one. So in other words, the library's had a comprehensive strategic plan. That should continue unaffected. The MRC is working on a strategic plan. That should continue unaffected. So this is not an effort to get in the way of anything that's been done. This is an effort to narrow the focus and recognize that there are strategic plan activities going on away from us. <clears throat> the four key areas are one, capital. Oh, I'm next sorry. slide. Yeah. Okay. I have to do this. One, uh, no. First is capital, no particular order, by the way. Capital, fiscal management, which we usually refer to as budgeting, the electric utility, which has come up often and came up tonight in, in Mr. Rowe's comments, and business operations, which probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but it will once I get to it. So capital, the objectives of this part of the exercise. Oh, God. You want me? No, I'm, I'm thank you. Oh, now we're good. Now it's my good deal. All right. The objectives in this exercise is basically to take the five-year plan that we've been operating with, I admit, and I would support the comment that indeed there is a plan. We take that plan and we tie it more closely to funding because that seems to be where there's been a breakdown. So we have, we, you can go to the website of the engineering department and look at all the projects that are proposed, but it's not tied to particular funding. And I think we need to do that. And we need to realistically manage what we can handle so that we're not committing to projects with the implication that we're going to do them very soon when we don't have the capacity to do them for a while. And I think we need a way of setting much clearer priorities so not only that we understand them, but that people in Academy and all the other streets in town who feel that they haven't gotten the service they need understand how it is we get to it. So what are the goals for this particular exercise? Well, <laughs> one is to, <clears throat> oh God, sorry. One is to manage expectations. In other words, how do we communicate with our residents regarding our capital plan? And how do we, for example, avoid situations where people, whether they live on Green Avenue or Academy, are wondering why it's six years on and they still haven't seen their project? We need to identify stable funding sources and consider the establishment of reserves. I put that as a question. And what I mean by the establishment of reserves links to the last item, the forecasting of projects. So in other words, if you could sit here and know that the water mains on six streets had to be repaired and there were six more streets with the same vintage water mains, I don't think it takes a genius to say it sounds like we're going to have to do it on six more blocks in the near future. And then we had to think about how we can start identifying and encumbering the money to do those projects. And maybe we can do them in advance of what we have to. You know, if you're two years ahead on a hundred year pipe replacement, it's not so bad. It's better than what happened to me. I live right off Woodland Avenue and I got to find out what our sewer system's like for a year after it exploded. <laughs> so, you know, I think in the, what the town needs is a way of getting more focused on looking at projects with some notion of where, what they're gonna be, what has to be taken care of, not just because it's currently broken, but because it's currently very old and unlikely to last much longer. And we need a system for setting priorities. I don't feel that an objective discussion can be had unless you have it within some framework. So everyone understands what are we looking for for projects to be number one in the coming year, number two, number three, off the list. And, and I think we need the principles that say that so that our citizens can say to themselves, 
you know, I'd like to see our street paved. I know they're not going to get to it because it doesn't have these three criteria satisfied. But I've talked to someone at town hall, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. And I have a good understanding now of where we're going to be. And that's something we don't deliver. Borough fiscal management or budgeting. What I'd like to see us do here is make the process much more analytical and a lot less subjective. And one way to do that is to begin looking at numerical ratios that are indicative of various aspects of how your budget's behaving, whether it be liquidity, surplus, reserves. Robert Califoot has begun doing that with the help of myself and Tom Bittinger. We've basically taken a number of the ratios that S&P uses. It made a lot of sense. They look like they're perfectly solid ways of looking at a, at a budget. And we've begun to employ them. And, and Robert is now recording them on a regular basis. I think that once we make clear how these would function, then part of the finance chair's report ought to be with those ratios every month, not just having me say some oblique comment about how we're doing well financially. Right? I'd like to be saying something more tangible to you, but we don't have a context in which to do that. Things are either good or they're not good. That's not how the way finance works. It's much more nuanced than that, and we need to be more nuanced and have a more objective way of doing this. I also think we need to review the process. I had to ask a lot of questions about it when I took on the role of finance liaison. I'm sure most people in town are unsure of how the thing works. I think we need to look at how the council functions and whether it should have a different role or a bigger role, <coughs> how management has a role in this activity, and how each department functions in coming up with a budget. And decide if that's the right way to do it or if indeed we can improve on, our, on the way we do things. As far as our goals, I mentioned in the ratio part of looking at surplus, level of liquidity, etc. I also would like to review department head guidelines. Each of our department heads are given guidelines as to how to prepare their portion of the budget. And as I mentioned earlier, they're doing a terrific job in adhering to the budget and, and actually doing better. I mean, there's a good sense of what it means to be careful with our money in this town, and it's gone very well. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't take a look at whether we can improve on multi-year planning, on how we do an annual review of goals. And also, I think that as much as we talk about transparency, and I believe the discussions this year were a little more open than they've been in some other years, we've got a ways to go. And it concerns me when someone who I know is, is uh, interested in what goes on, uh, such as Mr. Rowe, asked questions about our surplus last year because we distributed information on our surplus by source for three years so we could do a year-by-year -year comparison. And then we showed how that surplus was being used in the 2013 budget. That, only, that not only needs to continue, that needs to be sharpened, obviously, right? Because of the, by asking the question, it's, it's already saying, it's in a sense answering, answering are we doing an adequate job? Um, and then I'd like to turn to the, I'm going quickly because I know the hour and everyone's thinking, how long could a meeting last? But this one's obviously gone a while. I would like to go uh, to, to electric utility for a moment. The electric utility functions extremely well in this town. We've lived through two storms and came out in great shape. I'm not here to, to say that we need to have a strategic plan for them because they're not doing a good job. Quite the contrary. I think we need to have a strategic plan to ensure that they're operating in the most cost-effective manner and delivering services in the best way possible. And the goals I would have there is to look at cost and rate structure. I'd look at targets for annual surplus and the uses of those surplus, of that surplus. That's something where this group and the budget group would probably interact with each other. I don't think we want to have conversations where why don't we reduce the rate by X and take part of the surplus for that and take the other portion and use it for Y. I think what we want to do is have targets where we say if the surplus comes to this amount,
then that would trigger a rate reduction of X, or that would trigger a transfer of proceeds to Y, so that we're not bickering over every little piece of surplus that comes through. Surplus is going to continue to increase because of the pricing arrangements we have, and, and indeed we need a way to allocate that surplus intelligently, and I don't think you do it by looking at a pot of money and trying to spend it. I think you do it by thinking in terms of what the pot of money could look like and coming up with the rules to spend it. Um, we have power purchasing arrangements. We, I, you know, I feel strongly we need better guidelines. We obviously suffered through a couple of years because we made some decisions that I'm not here to second guess. Um, one of my favorite ma bosses once said to me, and would say this often, it was the right decision at the time. Right? But we know now that maybe we, it wasn't the right decision in retrospect. Well, we're not going to be that brilliant every time we make a decision. We need some guidelines. Do we want to go out multi-year? Do we want to do year over year? How much do we want to buy in spot market as, a, as opposed to futures markets? I also mentioned earlier about power production. We talked about solar energy as a possibility in Madison, and unfortunately, we didn't get far for a lot of reasons. But there are other ways to generate power. There are other possibilities. And I feel that we need to, as part of the strategic plan in this area, to look very carefully at whether there are opportunities for us to reduce further the cost of power to our residents. And then finally, in this area, sustainability. Everyone talks about it. We have a committee addressing it, and somehow we don't talk about power in that context, which seems to me to be a disconnect of major proportions. So I'd like to have us think in terms of the sustainability philosophy as it applies to our power production. And then uh, I, we talked about the, um, the Public Power uh, Association in New Jersey. We're always looking to see how to expand our activities with them. Uh, they're they're on to some very interesting ideas. I'm just getting involved with them, but I, I think we'll be hearing more about some interesting ways of acquiring power in, in much more um, productive ways for this town. And then I think we need rate guidelines. Like, you know, at what point do we, do we talk about a decrease in rates? At what point do we increase rates? By how much? Do we have a percentage in mind? Or are we just going to come up with a number that feels good? Uh, you know, I, my, my sense of all this is that without data, all you're doing is talking about opinions. And I think in a lot of things we've been doing, we need to start having more data. Um, business operations really refers to us, the council, the employees of the borough, everything that goes on in Borough Hall. And what we're interested in looking at, or what I'm interested in, is resonant satisfaction with everything that goes on here. I mean, I hear good and bad things when people tell me about council meetings. But let's be more precise. I mean, is there something we ought to be doing differently or better? Is there something that our department head should be doing differently? Or our administrators? Or you name it. I mean, I think it's open that we should consider all aspects of Borough Hall and ask the question, are our residents satisfied with what we're providing? And we should look at how we communicate with our residents, and we should look at our systems and see if they're up to the challenge. The goals, well, we need some kind of real assessment of resident interactions with employees and elected officials. That's not an area of expertise that I have, but it's certainly if customer service analysis is a common thing that's done in the private sector. There's no reason why we shouldn't be doing it for the public sector. We need to, we have a strong service delivery philosophy, I'm glad to say, um, but like everything else, it could bear strengthening, and I think that needs to be focused on and determine if there is something we could be doing better. And we need to look at communications. We do, we, we put it, we did a very simple thing six, six, seven months ago. We put a contact us button on the homepage of rosenet.org. And you know what? people actually hit it. They actually send emails to this council and to the administration by hitting that button. And in the past, 
I don't know if they'd ever get in touch with us, but there is a very, it's not a huge flow, but it's a daily flow of emails. We need to be able to better open that communication line. And I, and I would also say, I think we need to be able to talk to our residents through other ways than just having them come to meetings. I mean, coming to meetings is wonderful, but I think there are out of the ways to be, interact with us online. God knows what you can do online today, you know, in, in terms of what we're doing versus what's possible. We are literally just scratching the, the <coughs> surface of a very deep well, and I think we ought to be looking into that well and seeing what other ways we could use to communicate with our residents. The way I envision the process, and again, I'm wide open on all these things, is that each of these four areas has a committee. And the size of the committee should be determined on need and work and the committee chair. Um, my, own, my own personal bias is smaller is better, but I know people who like large groups. If you're in charge of a committee, do what you want. But, but know that we need deliverables. Um, the term of the chair will run until the plan is complete. And the notion would be that plans should be complete within a year. Uh, as far as the committee makeup, there's a lot of expertise in this town in a lot of these areas. But that's even added to in a very interesting way. Our mayor set up a committee of business executives in Madison. They meet on a period of uh, three, four times a year, talk about Madison in general terms, and then end up doing things. It's a very task-oriented group. If you're the CEO of a large company, not the kind of guy who just sits back. You like to roll your sleeves up and get things done. I would like to go to that group and say, who's in your customer service department that we could talk to? Because we want to talk about customer service in the borough. Who do you have who's gone through the budgeting process for your company who might be available to us to help out? And I'm reasonably confident that we'll get a good response from that group. So, so the people they can loan to us, in effect, together with the people in our own town, residents who have background in these various areas, I think we've come up with a very powerful uh, talent pool for these committees. I put down interim report by May 2014. I, you know, if we start before year end, I'd like to be sure that something's happening. So we should at least have some kind of interim report, say, third, through, a third of the way through the process. And as I mentioned earlier, I'd hope that these reports would be done in a year. Now, the next step is to have a much more in-depth conversation, and that'll take place at our next meeting. And, uh, you know, my fellow council members and mayor, if you would, I think we should, you know, are these the right four areas? How do you see these committees being run? Who should chair them? Are all open issues? And, um, I would like to say, in addressing Mr. Rowe's question, as well as other people I'm sure have it on their minds, I don't view this as lock the doors and we open them when it's done. I view this as incremental being done. So these committees should be rolling out things as we go along. I, too, don't want to wait until the end of next year to figure out how big an electric surplus we're going to have and what we're going to do with it. Right? I think an intelligent group of people sitting around talking about it and looking at some numbers, and looking at some data, and being analytical, could come up with some very interesting results for us in a fairly short order. So I, I'm sorry at the lateness of the hour, but it is what it is. I tried to do this as quickly as possible. I hope I didn't gloss over it too quickly. Thank you. All right, so as I said, we'll have a full discussion next meeting. Uh, ben, <coughs> thank you for your presentation. One of the things as we as you look towards the next meeting, keep in mind, and this, this happens, I've served on many strategic planning committees, all of a sudden the planning committee starts going to the solution level. This is what we'll be talking about next week is the process. You know, Ben talked about some potential solutions, but that's not where we want to be. We want to talk about the process. So those are the areas. If you have additional thoughts that you want uh, Ben to be aware of, email it. Please do not email any thoughts or suggestions to mayor and council because that may encourage off uh, online discussion and the discussion should be taking place here. So thank you very much and we will have more to come in a week and a half. We'll move on to ordinances for hearings. You can call oh, the statement. 
Yes, the ordinance scheduled for hearing were introduced by title and passed on first reading at a regular meeting of the council held on September 9, 2013, was posted and filed according to the law, and copies were made available to the general public requesting same. I call up ordinances for second reading and ask the clerk to read said ordinance by title. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Chapter 195 of the Borough Code Land Development Ordinance regarding application notification requirement. I open the hearing for Ordinance 40-2013. Anyone wishing to comment on this ordinance, please step to the lectern, state your name, and keep your comments to three minutes or less with the emphasis on less at this point. Anyone wishing to be heard? Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 40-2013. I second that. Council discussion? Yes, I just want to remind everybody this was a recommendation from the planning board. Uh, it refers to when an, uh, an application is conforming and no variance is requested, neighbors were not notified in the past. Now this, will, this amendment will allow neighbors to be notified um, and can come to that hearing. Thank you, Thank you. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Walkowitz? Yes. Mr. Ripholtz? Yes. I declare Ordinance 40 2013 adopted and finally passed, and ask the clerk to publish notice thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 41 2013. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Chapter 195 of the Borough Code entitled Land Development <coughs> Ordinance to make various changes to implement recommendations in the annual report adopted by the Zoning Board of Adjustment. I open the hearing for Ordinance 41-2013. Anyone wishing to be heard? Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 41-2013. Second. Council discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Walkowitz? Yes. Mr. Ripholtz? Yes. I declare Ordinance 41 2013 adopted and finally passed, and ask the clerk to publish notice thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. And now we're on to invitation for discussion of two, where you may comment on anything not restricted to the agenda items. And again, you're restricted to three minutes, and I also ask that you respect the uh, late hour. Sam? Sam Cerciaro, Park Avenue, Madison. <laughs> well, uh, just a couple things, but I had a few days because it's getting late. Um, you know, you're talking about the roads, and Madison is, is in a lot of disarray. You've got the sidewalks. And ro what I would suggest, being in the construction business all my life, and it makes common sense to me, and I want you to consider this. And I don't know if you can do it by law, but let's maybe we can change some of the laws that goes on. Maybe, maybe we need change. I would suggest, for example, if you're going to do Academy, you're going to do Vinton, Keep, or whatever of these streets, you get one consultant. You're going to do these three streets, you get one consultant, one set of specs, so to speak, for the all three roads, if that's what you're going to do next year, and believe me, we'll save money. Then you'll get the big contract and keep these little nits and nats out of the Madison because it seems like... Uh, We've got different contractors do different roads, and some of the jobs, you know, they don't, they're not geared up. You, the bigger the contractor, the more equipment, just like Main Street, on, on, uh, they did it in a day. They, they got machines as big as this building here. So what I'm suggesting is, again, like I said, put all three roads, whatever you're going to do, whatever you're going to spend, and put it together under one umbrella, have one, contra one, one uh, consultant put the specs together, and when you offer bids, the contractor knows he's going to do all three roads in Madison, he's going to do this and that. You'll save a lot of money, and you'll get a better job. you get more value for your dollar. Believe me when I tell you. That's how construction works. Thank you. Uh, number two, another thing that makes common sense to me, the Green Village Road School. We're going to be selling for, I don't know, $8, 10 $11 million, whatever it is. I suggest, and it makes sense, that the Kings Road School, the, the, the headquarters on Woodland Road, I mean, 
I was here a year. We did this wrong. We should have finished this east side of the building. It's, it's a mess over there. I, I think we could save a lot of money if we get the Board of Education or whoever and put them on the other side, on the east side, and we're together, you could save a lot of money instead of having a uh, superintendent for, pu for public works and the Board of Ed, another superintendent for public, he gets an assistant, he gets an assistant. It's only a two by two square, uh, square it's four square miles in Madison. You don't need all these uh, superintendents, assistants, and secretaries, and computers. If the borough and the Board of Ed got together, because it's our taxpayer money, we'll save a lot of money, share maybe big computers, or like I said, you won't need all these assistants and supers and all that. So think about that. I mean, I mentioned it because it should have been done. You just can't leave that east wing the way it is now. So again, like I said, and we'll save a lot of money by sharing services. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Paro, 25 Pine Ave, already signed in. Um, one thing you might want to consider, I was looking at the borough webpage. You already have 20 or more boards, commissions, councils, authorities. You may want to look at who matches up well with your strategic plan groups and either ask those groups or a subcommittee of those groups. You already have people who are appointed for multiple years. You also have people who have expertise in those particular areas instead of reinventing the wheel. I think you'd find at least two or three would fit very nicely. Yeah, good, very good um, point. I guess the second question is, and I made my comment about the electric utility surpluses, and I, I hate to ask Mr. Wolfowitz directly, but does this mean we will not see really much of anything? Um, actually, no. Okay, let me ask the chair, and through the chair, um, I, I, I still say, I actually I thought it was going to be done by May, now we're saying it's going to be done a year from now. Will we or will we not know how much of the utility is going to generate? It is not in my opinion, a complicated thing to calculate. You can do it within a pessimistic and op optimistic range, but it shouldn't take a committee of people and six, seven, eight, twelve months to figure it out. Yeah, it certainly would, would not preclude anything else that is a higher priority. Okay. So, and the last time I talked to Mr. Wolkowitz, I offered to come in and help him right away figure it out, free of charge. And I, I, I understand <coughs> I've been advocating for this. I'm running for office, but I've been advocating for this for a lot longer. And whether I win or lose, I will be back here next year. So I'm, I'm sure we'll be win or lose. Just I'm sure volunteer. we'll be keeping you busy. Thank you. <laughs> Frank Merckx, Woodcliffe Drive. Uh, sorry for making the meeting just an ounce longer. Um, with the strategic plan, I just want to point out that obviously Drew University is a great resource up the road. So if we can be, have our students included in any part of that process, that would be fantastic. Um, whether as an educational opportunity or also if you talk about using technology, there's no one better than that. So that's my point. Excellent. I also point out that we have a fabulous Drew alum who was presenting earlier today. Excellent idea. Thank, thank you, Frank. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Seeing that, I close this part of the meeting and we move on to introduction ordinances. May the clerk uh, read the statement, please. Yes, uh, ordinance scheduled for the first reading have a hearing date set for October 28th, 2013. All will be published in the daily record, posted on the bulletin board, and made available to members of the public requesting copies. I call up the ordinances for first reading and ask the borough clerk to read said ordinances by title. Ordinance 45-2013. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, supplementing Chapter 136 of the Code of the Borough of Madison, entitled Parks, Establishing User Fees for the Borough Recreation Programs, and Establishing the Process to Rent Borough Parks and Fields. Mayor, I move Ordinance 45-2013. I second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello. Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Walkowitz? Yes. Mr. Repholtz? Yes. Ordinance 46-2013. Ordinance 46-2013, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, amending Chapter 163 of the Borough Code entitled Smoking, to permit smoking on all borough property, including public parks and recreational areas. Prohibit was the idea, but... Uh, to prohibit smoking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, I move Ordinance 46-2013. 
I'd like a Diet Coke. In six yeah. months. <laughs> you, <laughs> got yeah. you got it. Further discussion? <laughs> Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Walkowitz? Yes. Mr. Ripholtz? Yes. Consent agenda resolutions. Clerk, please read the statement. Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is supported by a certificate, certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. Mayor, I move consent agenda resolutions R283-2013 to R293-2013. Second. Second. I second. Discussion? Any need to be pulled? Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yep. Mr. Walkowitz? Yes. Mr. Ripholtz? Yes. There's no unfinished business. Uh, up, yeah, we caught that yup. <laughs> <laughs> Approval of the vouchers. Can you read the voucher register, please? Ah, uh, yes. It took you so long. Okay, voucher register summary, October 16, 2013. Public safety. $26,005.17. Health and public assistance, $7,926.24. Public works and engineering, $314,742.51. Community affairs, $1,668.63. Finance and borough clerk, Three million one hundred twenty-three thousand two hundred seventy-six dollars and seventy-nine cents. Utilities one million three hundred sixty-four thousand thirty-two dollars and sixty-six cents. A total of four million eight hundred thirty-seven thousand six hundred fifty-two dollars. Mayor, I move approval of the vouchers. Second. Second. Discussion. Roll we'll call a vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Walkowitz? Yes. Mr. Ripholtz? Yes. We have no new business, so Ed, you get to make a motion to adjourn. Um, I'd like to first of all apologize if, if it took, if I offended. I'm sorry, I don't mean to do that. But I'm going to call what I think is a, what I need to call and, and be verbal about it. I did not mean to personally offend you people, my fellow councilmen. Uh, with that, I'd like to make the motion to adjourn this my first meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. you don't have to vote on it? <laughs> yep. You got a second? Yep. And who seconded?